Welcome to the third day uh, of the sixth uh, International Summary University on Geoparks, uh, Sustainable Regional Development uh, and LC Lifestyles. Uh, after two fantastic days uh, with a lot uh, of very interesting and um, uh, uh, very up-to-date uh, up uh, thematics, uh, I, I'm sure that we will close with a kind of gold, gold key uh, the third day because we have a very, very interesting panel of uh, keynotes with the speakers that are worldwide recognized uh, and uh, that they will share with us uh, important experiences um, that the geoparks are facing, special those that are uh, related uh, with the uh, with the ocean with the ocean uh, the people and the, this cooperation for uh, sustainable uh, development so we will start today uh, with the presentation by miss pakaporn singh vashira voraku uh, from thailand um, she she is an, an mba and uh, she works as International Affairs Coordinator and also member of the Administrative Committee of the Korat uh, Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. However, she was involved uh, um, since 2014 in the development of the geoparks in Thailand, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, UNESCO Global Geopark Satun. Um, and uh, she uh, has uh, already very good knowledge and experience on uh, geoparks, and uh, she uh, was involved already in many uh, training courses, not only in Thailand, but also uh, abroad. So it's a pleasure to us to have uh, Ms. Pakaporn uh, with us, um, sharing uh, her um, experience with us and the relation of the Thai geoparks and the ocean. Uh, thank you, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Pakaporn, uh, for uh, the acceptation of our invitation. It's an honor to us to have you with us. And from now, uh, the floor uh, is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Professor Atusar. Thank you for uh, have a chance being with you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Thailand. Thailand is five o'clock in the afternoon now. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. In perfect yes. conditions. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm an international affairs coordinator for uh, Kulat Aspiring Geopark right now and uh, advisory board of the Aspiring Geopark 2. And then um, uh, if you see this, it is Thailand and uh, Thailand, you will see that. I mean, Thailand is the, the part of not, uh, Asia. Uh, we're close to Myanmar, close to Malaysia, close to Cambodia and Laos. I mean, if everyone can uh, used to come to Thailand, you will uh, recognize that. I mean, we know that Thailand has a beautiful beach. I mean, and uh, uh, white sand, blue sea, and some people who like to visit the Emerald Buddha, they will say that it's a beautiful Buddha uh, temple. And some people know about Thailand, about Tuk Tuk, or the Floating Market, or even the ancient temples. We have, I mean, many people know about Thailand, but not a lot of people know about uh, uh, the geopark. Thailand has the first UNESCO Global Geopark in 2018. We are a member of the APTN. And we are, I mean, the first uh, UNESCO Global Geo Park, Geo Park is in the southern Thailand, really close to Langkawi or Malaysia. And this is the map of Thailand. And then the, we have, this is a UNESCO Global Geo Park at the south of Thailand. And we have one uh, aspiring UNESCO Global Geo Park, it's called Korat Geo Park. I'm from Korat Aspiring Geo Park, uh, UNESCO Global Geo Park. We have another, uh, three aspiring geoparks in Thailand. One is Konkan aspiring geopark. It just uh, is having sent a uh, uh, letter of intent to the UNESCO Global Geopark Secretariat last uh, on on the July. This is the the next uh, 
potential uh, geoparks in Thailand to would like to be the member of APCN and DCN. We have about eight potential areas to develop the geopark in Thailand. And this is, I would like to, uh, to present, to introduce or to share everyone about the Kura Geopark first, because Kura Geopark is a new geopark in Thailand. It's aspiring uh, geopark, a uh, global geopark. Uh, the area is about 3,100 square kilometers, population is about 754. Uh, people in this area. We start develop the geopark since 2016 and 2019 with an application dossier to the Secretary of the UNESCO Global Geopark. And we just had the evaluation mission last month. And our geoparks are very beautiful. I think it's not, it doesn't have the very built or huge monument, but we have a very strong local community involved in every geo site uh, to develop uh, the sustainable development uh, for the local community. Our geo park has a Mesozoic rockland forms and Mesozoic Cenozoic fossils. Uh, geological history of the Cora Geo Park are between late Jurassic to uh, Quaternary period, about 150 million years ago to present. Um, I have the background in chemical engineering and MBA, so I maybe not touch the very deep in geological history of the geopark, but I can overview uh, the information about the geopark. This is the, uh, the uh, uh, geological uh, formation in our geopark from late Jurassic to, to Quaternary. It's from here to here, right? And then this is the... Uh, Stratigraphic geological highlight of our geopark. Uh, the geo, uh, Kora Geopark is on the uh, sedimentary rocks. Uh, number three is the oldest uh, sedimentary rocks of the Kora Geopark. It's about 150 million years ago. And then every, nearly every uh, for, uh, formation of our rocks uh, found some uh, uh, evidence, some fossil. Um, if we, if we say that, I mean, our geopark uh, is uh, about 65, 55 million years ago, uh, the Indian era and Eurasian tectonic plate uh, caused the rock layers of coral group to be formed into coral basin. You will see that on the left is the west of the coral geoparks uplift by the tectonic movement and uh, and uh, and uh, according to the difference in resistance to erosion of the different layers, all layers, rock layer on the left hand side, is mean on the west of the, of the geopark is the older uh, uh, rocks and the younger is on the right hand side, is mean in the east of the geopark. And then according to the uplift of this area, so the land is full, and then it's make the cresta area uh, make this on the left hand side. Uh, when you see in this, I mean picture in this picture, you will you can I mean Kora Geos Park is part of Kora Park. Um, the highest area is in the left hand side. This area, this side, it's on the high the high uh, the high hill. It's about five hundred eighty meters from uh, the average uh, sea level. And then this is this is the first line of the cuesta because this uh, on the left hand side, this area is a uh, deep stiff and this is the uh, lecine, lecine stiff from here, this area is a gardural slope. So uh, on, the, on this area, uh, we can see the very beautiful landscape like this. It's, in Thailand, we call it Cuesta landscape. It's quite people in this area familiar with this kind of mountain, but they don't know, the local community don't know what is that and what is the important to the geological history. Uh, they know that, okay, we have a very special mountain until we start doing the geopark and educate local community to know, to understand the history of this landscape. People really appreciate that. 
And then they never know that this is called pesta. They know ito. In Thailand, we call ito because it looks like the knife. For the farmer, they use it. And, and this, uh, because of this uh, landscape, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, electricity generating authority of Thailand use this landscape to equip the windmill, about 14 of windmill equipped in this area. So uh, they have the, like, uh, the alternative of energy uh, generation and the local community in this area involves the project to, to generate uh, alternative income by providing the bicycle to the visitor to hide and ride around the mountain and the uh, area of the electricity generating authority. So the local community, they can get uh, involved. The, the plants, the AECAT, they get the energy, but local community, they can get alternative income. Both of them work together to take care of the landscape and the forest in this area under the protection of Forestry Act. And in the Kora Geo Park, we have a, uh, we don't have the very big, a big monument, but we have a lot of like landform like this in the uh, private and in the public area. Some of the public area like a temple, uh, the forestry department allow the temple local community to have to, to, to provide activity like a nature field trip or geo trip, geo trail for the local community. This is very important for the students and the local community to, to have the activity to, to study about the rock. And um, in our geo park, we have many kinds of rock that are highly resistant and the ancient people use this kind of rock and cut it by their ancient instrument to, to build the sanctuary which related to Angkor Wat in the, in, which is the World Heritage Site of Cambodia, which is the very similar and with uh, the same age and link with that uh, temple in Angkor Wat. And the style of the, the building and the cutting edge of the stone is similar. So this is very important as a as, uh, site is a geological and cultural sites protected by the government. Uh, the fossil, uh, if they fall in this area, protected by Fossil Protection Act. And uh, the, uh, uh, this site, which related to the sanctuary, the Department of Fire Art protected as the like, uh, uh, cultural site. And uh, many of students use this site to study, including students from uh, geology department, uh, junior geologist scholars use this area or use this size as the uh, for the field trip. <laughs> and this is another size, uh, geological and nature, culture, and geological size in our geo park. Uh, the forest protected by Forestry Act, <laughs> and then the <laughs> Marcus, please, please, Marcus. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry, back. <laughs> and then uh, we have the painting on the, the rock. The rock. You can see that if you come to Thailand, you will see that we have the rock, which are very high from from the floor. They paint it with the red color, which are uh, nature color. Uh, the red color to uh, to tell everyone about their daily life. And uh, this one, uh, uh, we believe that is about 4,000 years ago. This is the evidence that uh, we can prove that there are some people or there were the people uh, starting living in this area. This is our uh, heritage, cultural heritage protected by the acts on ancient monument, antique object, of art and uh, natural museum. And then we also have some monument, like a natural monument. This monument can be uh, the site for students to study about erosion of the sedimentation rocks. And then uh, every day we have nearly about uh, 50 students to visit in this area. And all of the whole area managed by home, this means local community, Temple, temple uh, is the monk uh, take care of this forest and this area. 
and school, local community, they send students to school and school come to involve this project uh, after we uh, present about the geo park. So this community, this temple, they manage this site uh, by the model of uh, HTS, home, temple and school after they collaborate with the geo park. And this is the director of the geo park, Dr. Pratyang. And this is this uh, steel site also is the records. It's the important, very special size that to record the natural painting of the cross bed or overturned cross bed too. And then it has the man-made prehistorical painting on the rock as well. So this is a very important site for students and public uh, is as the uh, outdoor classroom. And in our geo park also has like uh, uh, also found the new species of Econodon, about three uh, new species in this area. Because uh, in this area, we have a corporate formation is about 110, 15, 115 uh, million years ago. Uh, we found a lot of uh, uh, fossil of dinosaur. Uh, under the, I mean, everywhere, if we open the surface soils, we will find a rock, a rock of salt, uh, rocks under that. And then if we uh, study in uh, deeply in that rocks, we will find a lot of fossil. And this is a very important for project for our geo park. Uh, we work with the Fukui uh, Dinosaur Museum in Japan. And this is the kind of new species of dinosaur, uh, of mammals. And then we found a lot of ancient elephant and, and including uh, the uh, uh, crocodiles and many things. This is the uh, uh, international significance of our geopark. And that's the, I would like to highlight this is the, is the, our ocean related to the geopark because this area, our geopark, you will see this is our geo park. On the left hand side is the is the high hill, is the Cresta area. But in the middle, in the middle, we found a lot of fossil dinosaur in corporate formation about 115 years ago, 50 million years ago. And on the right hand side in this area, underneath of this area are the rock salt, very, very thick rock salt. So we have a, this, a, this is a salt on the ground. On um, people in this area work with the geo park, and then they don't. Uh, at the beginning, they don't know why they have a problem with the rock salt. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you work, they work with the low, uh, uh, geo park, they know that this is a very important uh, 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 rock salt and geological heritage that they should work with. And then the uh, student have the uh, learning center and local community have the product, and. This is the Kora Geo Park that we related to the sea. And then Satun Geo Park, I overview you quickly. This is a Satun Geo Park, which is a terrestrial card, very beautiful. And then they found a lot of fossil, it's ancient sea before. If you say this, you will say that I mean, under, I mean, about 551 years ago, it was the, the ocean and then, for nowadays, it's all it's ocean as well, but a different part of ocean. People in this area they use the story of ancient ocean to uh, to present that uh, uh, how do you say like uh, to make the collaboration with the national park who take care of this area, and then provide the tourism activity, and then they do benefit sharing between the local community and the national park and the kayak people, fishery boat and every, everyone in the local area, they can get the benefit from uh, tourism of this area, including a uh, woman in, they can provide food for visitor. And this is a local community, they provide the tourism and tourist uh, attract, I mean, tourist uh, tour, tour guide and of this area. I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I have a lot of things to, was to, to show everyone. <laughs> was you. perfect. The management of the time was really, really perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us. So beautiful and impressive uh, place. So beautiful pictures. Uh, thank you for your presentation. That uh, was uh, really, really nice. 
So uh, if someone has a question for Ms. Pakapon, please uh, take the floor. No one? Uh, no one. Well, people are uh, congratulating you. Uh, well, um, the question it is, uh, you have a, a country that have a, a large coastal area uh, and many of these places are very beautiful, have natural beauties. Uh, and uh, from your knowledge, uh, what you need to do uh, in Thailand and uh, the, the, uh, the geoparks from Thailand to uh, it's possible to, to create more awareness about the oceans. Uh, the geoparks could be uh, an effective tool uh, for uh, to increase this awareness or is something that is already in the blood of the people. So people are, since is born, are connected with the ocean. I think um, I think uh, some of uh, the activity um, in in Satun, especially in Satun, yeah. they already have a lot of activity because uh, Satun has the uh, in I cannot remember in two thousand in nineteen in two thousand something that there was tsunami before. Yes, two thousand four. In, in Thailand, they, they suffered yeah. the tsunami two thousand and four. Uh, very yeah, and and they had uh, I mean they faced the tsunami before, and then uh, people in that area they realized about that ocean yeah, can be their uh, alternative income and can be their the source of the food, but it's very important to understand the the, the sea the the ocean because uh, uh, many people that uh, found that I mean a lot of uh, geohazard like a, a sinkhole after after the tsunami, they found that many sinkhole ex exposed in surrounding area. And then this is, uh, I think, the activity that uh, local community in Saturn, they try to uh, promote in, in the future with the connection with the ocean and the geopark, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the acceptation of our, our invitation. Uh, it was very nice to have you with us. It was very, uh, for, for sure, all, all of those that are uh, now listening uh, the course are happy with beautiful, magnificent pictures thank that you. you shared and the good thank examples you. that we shared. So thank, thank you. you so much. And uh, now it is time for the, the second keynote is someone very special also that we will uh, have talking with us. Um, uh, Professor Dr. Xiao Shi Jin uh, is a professor at the Institute of Geology of the Chinese Academy of Geological Sciences. He is uh, involved in the geopark since the year 2000. So it's a person with a massive experience and a massive knowledge uh, about um, geoparks uh, is also a very, very uh, worldwide recognized expert uh, on UNESCO Global Geoparks. He's a member of the advisor committee of the Asian Pacific uh, Geoparks Network, member of the Global Geoparks Executive Board, uh, Vice President of the Global Geoparks Network, uh, former member of the UNESCO Global Geopark Council, was one, one of the founders. And today he is the coordinator of the Asia Pacific uh, Geoparks Network, being at the same time senior evaluator of Geoparks. So what it is almost impossible to have someone uh, with uh, so uh, big knowledge about Geoparks. So it's an honor to have uh, Professor uh, Xiao Xi Jin uh, with us. Thank you so much uh, for uh, accepting our invitation. It's an honor to have you with us. Thank you uh, to share your time uh, with us. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sato, for your introduction. It's a big honor for me to be invited to speak here because you have uh, talked too much about me. So that 
Das stimmt nicht. <lacht> nee, das stimmt. <lacht> okay. Äh, so, please, we are looking everything perfect. Ja. Yeah. Okay. So, first of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here and this wonderful summer university, especially I thank uh, Satu, uh, Atu San for this invitation. And uh, uh, he also asked me to talk about with the topic of uh, uh, Chinese UGDPs and the oceans. So uh, this is actually uh, challenging for me uh, with, uh, we will talk about Chinese uh, uh, UGDPs and the oceans, uh, because we have uh, 41 UGDPs in China, but we have only uh, one here in Hong Kong and one here in the uh, most part of China, uh, the Leichun UNESCO Global Geopark. Only a little bit of here, they have uh, coastal uh, marine areas. So as uh, everybody knows, the marine environment is fully included in the UNESCO Global Geoparks guidelines for sustainable use of Earth's natural resources. So also uh, our geoparks here uh, in the Southeast Coast, on the South and Southeast Coast, are also working to get, uh, towards achieving the clean ocean and protecting their biodiversity and the geodiversity. And I have visited these uh, uh, geoparks sometimes, and uh, I'm sure they are doing their best in that direction as uh, indicated in the guidelines of uh, sustainable use of Earth's natural resources. Uh, but today, so I'd like to remind you that the rest of all over here, the geoparks, here are on continent. Uh, they seem have no relations with the oceans. Uh, in today's time, the only the erosions detractors from these areas they are brought to the oceans, the coast, by big and small rivers. So they contribute sediments along the coastlines. Uh, actually, but many significant geological heritage in these geoparks are closely related to oceans in the past. The well recorded the variation of continents and oceans in the Earth's history. So we have many uh, geoparks here and uh, everyone have their very good geological heritages. Uh, oceans in terms of human lifespans uh, seem perpetual in their places. Uh, normally uh, human beings can live uh, max mostly to 70 to 80 years to 90 year, uh, years, a few can over 100 years, but in, th in this time spans, we cannot say the moving of the oceans from this place to that place. But they have changed significantly in the Earth's histories. For example, in the Middle Devonian time, that is about uh, 370 million years ago, the continent and the ocean distribution move like this one more or less like this one. So it's quite different from the present configuration of continents and the oceans. So also in our geoparks, they have recorded the development, the variations of the change, uh, all the changes of ocean and the continents in the past times. So I will concentrate from uh, here from uh, the early uh, Precambria and uh, to 
the end of a Triassic times. That is about 1.4 giga years to about 200 million years in that period. So today I'd like to show uh, how oceans, uh, more precisely, and that is a marine environment changed in Earth's history and how changes affect the biosphere. So I would take South China here, South China, for examples, because uh, we don't have uh, so much time to talk so intensively. If you look at the map here on the right hand side, you will find China geologically is a mosaic of continental blocks, for example, up here, like here in North China, and here in the Yangtze platform, and many here in Tarim Basin. All these blocks are sutured together by the Oregons here. The, these lines, these are all the Oregons. So if, if China is now, if you look at this map, all is a big continent, but geologically, it's a mosaic of continental blocks sutured together by Oregon's. Even here, uh, our example area, that is South China, it is also comprised two uh, main uh, areas. One is here, it's called the Yangtze platform. It's quite stable area. Another one is here is a, a called a Cassisia fort belt. So only uh, since the Devonian time, so it's about 420 million years, it become a single bigger block. So today I'd like to use the geological records all the general heritage here in South China uh, to demonstrate four processes or events. So we can demonstrate a lot of, but uh, I think first we choose four processes or events, what happened, what can be indicated by our geological heritage preserved in these geoparks. The first one I'd like to, uh, to demonstrate that there was the the known, the earliest marine sediments, that was the Mesoproterozoic, as about uh, uh, 1.6 giga years to 1.2 giga years on the platform, on the younger platform here in South China. Another uh, process is a widespread Cambria to a division marine environment on the younger platform. This is also uh, uh, all connected with the oceans. The third one is due to the Carboniferous Permian limestone, demonstrating warm tropical environment, also the marine environment. This contrasting the cold and cool temperature on the Gondwana continent, that was on the southernmost part of the south hemisphere, and during that time there is a glaciation. The fourth point, the eruption over the basalts here in the middle of Permian time fundamentally changed the environment of South China. Thereafter, the marine area shrinks, shrinked, and uh, until the end, uh, the whole area emerged. So first, that is uh, uh, something that I want to to show that is uh, the known, the earliest marine sediments uh, on the Yangtze platform. Uh, these very old sediments, that is uh, carbonate sediments, there's a limestone and dolomites, plus some shells and uh, uh, other silicic classic sediments. That was found here in the Shenunjia UNESCO Global Geopark. Now here is a gate, a one gate of the geopark. Here is a one scenery of uh, this geopark. 
this Joe Park is uh, a well uh, known for its uh, beautiful scenery and uh, local uh, ethnic group, and local cultural, and a lot of uh, geological heritages. We choose here only one of the very important geological heritage that is the oldest uh, sediment rocks here in, in this part of the Yangtze platform. And in other areas, this Mesoproterozoic uh, sediments have not been found in other areas of the Yangtze platform. So this is a very known geological heritage in this UNESCO Global Geo Park. What important is the geological the sediments here uh, record on uh, the Mesoproterozoic from the 1,600 to 1,000 million years ago. In that period, there is a marine and shallow, a little bit deeper marine environment uh, where all these simbedded limestones and dolomites and other silicic climatic sediments in the beddings are uh, deposited. So this records the oldest marine environment on the Yangtze Plantable or even the whole South China. So the second uh, process I'd like to demonstrate that is the widespread Ordovician to uh, Cambrian to Ordovician marine environment on the Yangtze platform. That is the from Cambria is about from the 540 to the latest uh, Ordovician or to early, even to early Silurian. That is 440 million years. During that period, from here, there is a widespread marine, a shallow marine environment here on the Yangtze platform. The pictures on the right hand side, that is uh, from our Xianqi UNESCO Global Geo Park, where the limestones of the Cambria, especially the upper part, uh, the middle and upper part, of the limestone were so well developed. And the two golden spikes, that is the, the uh, GSPs, were established within this UNESCO Globe Geo Park. The pictures here show the well developed uh, the Fujian uh, limestones about this age, but 500 million years ago. So this uh, limestone shows there was in the Cambria time and during that time there was a, a marine environment here, at least in these areas. So also in the old vision time, uh, this example is also from the Xianqi UNESCO Global Geo Park. We have here a middle old vision limestones. Uh, what uh, Beautiful is the limestone here in red and brownish red color. This because of the content of some uh, some elements of ice and uh, other colorful uh, elements in it. Also, this is just an example in Xianti uh, UNESCO Global Java. We can also find uh, uh, old vision limestones widespread on the Yangtze platform. It can also be found in several UNESCO global geo parks. So the third uh, point I'd like to emphasize is also the geological heritage of our geo parks here in South China can demonstrate the carboniferous to Permian limestones as uh, recorded in, se in several geo parks. That also means during that time, the Carboniferous and Permian times, there is a shallow, warm marine environment on the South China. This is from the Shilin UNESCO Global Geo Park. You see the warm water uh, corals here is a compound corals here. Here are some of the crinoids, bronchiopoda here. You saw 
those are another uh, cover photos. All these are de depicting a warm, shallow marine environment all in South China during the Carboniferous and, and Permian times. This time is from the west part of Xiangxi UNESCO Global Geo Park. So this Carboniferous and Permian limestone widespread. So in that time, contrasting what happened in Gondwana, that was the southernmost continent, where glaciers prevailed from Carboniferous to the earliest Permian. So this is quite different. This means all the, those are the limestones, the fossils from all these limestones indicate South China was in the tropical across the equator area, like today's Malaysia or Indonesia in that part of your latitude. Finally, at the fourth point I'd like to mention, this is the eruption of a basalt during the late part of middle Permian, so around 260 million years ago, there is a, a basalt eruption here in South China, especially in the west part of South China here. This is what spread eruption here. Sorry, I cannot uh, show you a very beautiful eruption uh, uh, pictures because there's no such big pictures uh, can be found in, in the field. If you see the in other television programs to so see the eruption in uh, North Atlantic or in Hawaii or in other places, so it's very beautiful and very okay. But here in the South China, you find the Permian basalt. It looks like this, but I uh, can guarantee that these are really uh, basalt. But uh, it's weather here if you. Or in the outcrops, it looks like this. But after the eruption of uh, the basalt here around 260 million years ago, South China becomes shrinking. The marine environment becomes shrinking. And uh, even since the late Triassic times, about 227 million years ago, from, from here upwards, the whole South China emerged and it became a continent environment. And that environment continued to today. So what lessons could we learn from the past? So when we, when we talk uh, from change in natural, uh, 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 change of, uh, of our environment, we, need to recognize what are the natural tendencies. Some are, uh, that is the primary of uh, the change of nature itself. Some, what are human induced changes? So if we want to pr protect the environment, if we want to, uh, to reduce uh, our influence of uh, man induced uh, damage to the environment, we have to recognize which is the natural one which are the human induced changes. So that could be a lesson that we can learn from the past. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, because I, I don't know uh, whether I have a clear, explained very clearly what happened or what I really want to demonstrate because this is much, uh, uh, or much more geological, uh, not so, uh, uh, like a popular science. Thank, thank you, Professor. <laughs> it, it, it was really perfect because uh, I, I would like to thank you this this, this vision because uh, it's really really important when we talk about ocean. Uh, this this view, uh, uh, this vision, and this uh, this uh, knowledge about the past uh, that uh, sometimes we need to understand that uh, many of the information about the ocean and the dynamic. Uh, to understand the dynamic of the ocean nowadays, uh, we we need uh, we need these and we have again someone. Okay, uh, we need to understand uh, what happened in the past in order to to find uh, eventually some solutions for the resilience 
to face to face uh, challenges that uh, we have nowadays and for sure in the future. Thank you so much for this so beautiful presentation. Uh, plenty of uh, nice information, beautiful pictures from uh, your uh, your country. Uh, and uh, thank you, thank you uh, really for uh, this presentation and for sharing your your time and knowledge uh, with us. So, uh, despite the time is already a little bit far, uh, I will uh, open the floor for someone that want to make a question to Professor uh, Xiao Shi Jin. Well, people are, are reacting, uh, congratulating, <laughs> congratulating you. Uh, so, uh, Professor, from my side, my uh, <clears throat> thank you uh, to you for uh, uh, your time to be and for, for the acceptation of the invit invitation to be with us. Uh, it was a great pleasure and thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, so beautiful and important uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And now uh, it's time to go forward and to go to uh, <laughs> Dr. Emaline Rosado Gonzalez. Um, to me, it's very special to introduce uh, Dr. Emaline uh, because she is, uh, in fact, my, my right arm and part of the left arm uh, during the, uh, the build up of this. Um, summer university not only this year but since long time uh, she works directly uh, with me in this moment uh, she is a postdoc uh, student uh, in the unesco share on unesco global on uh, geoparks uh, sustainable regional development and healthy lifestyles uh, she uh, has uh, she have a grant of the uh, foundation for science and technology from portugal uh, to do this uh, postdoc. Uh, she is already a, a very uh, recognized expert on uh, um, Latin America and Caribbean geoparks and the sustainable development goals. Um, is member of the scientific staff of the Mixteca Alta UNESCO Global Geopark in Mexico, is member of the Geoscience Center, uh, a research center of the University of Coimbra. Uh, in in Portugal, and um, well, uh, Emaline uh, is uh, someone that many of you already know, but uh, she will um, share with you um, an important talk uh, about uh, facing the climate change in the mixed tech alta UNESCO Global Geopark. So, Emaline, thank you. Uh, for your presence and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Arthur. Um, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everyone all around the world. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, be here with you to share a little bit of the experience of Mixtec Alta UNESCO Global Geopark. But also I want uh, to thank once again, Professor Artur Sa for uh, inviting me to share this lecture, but also for letting me be part of this amazing summer university of the six past years. So it's always an honor to, to work with him and, and be part of this adventure of the International Summer University. Um, well, the challenge that was uh, made to me was to, uh, share how uh, Mixteca Alta UNESCO Global Geopark uh, face the climate change. What is the reality of this, uh, of this geopark? Also, I want to mention something very important. Even a, a part of the, what I'm going to present is a work also carried on by me. A lot of the work I am presenting here is uh, also made by all the Mixteca Alta Geopark team. And when I say this, it's not only the scientific stuff. We also have a lot, a lot of work done by the local communities. So all of this work I uh, share with you is uh, thanks to the to the local people also. And first of all, uh, only to 
to us uh, to put this in context. As all of you are quite aware, we are facing a new challenge regarding uh, the climate change. We have seen around different observations that the average medium temperature of the global uh, reality in the earth is increasing. And this also uh, has to be with the, we are ha having more heat waves. It's a correlation clearly note, uh, but not only the heat waves. Uh, uh, we have a lot of the extreme events going increasing uh, every year, because uh, also the temperature is increasing. So the reality is that we are uh, in front of uh, quite a challenge that we have to face with different efforts. And in this sense also, as all of you may be aware, we have since the uh, 90s decade, but also before, but the strong efforts regarding the environmental issues challenges uh, starting the decade of 90s with the Earth Summit, the 21 Agenda, that this uh, evolved in the 2000 to the 8 Millennium Development Goals, also having into account not only the environmental challenges, but also in the social and economic dimensions. And as also you are quite aware, because in the past two days, we have talked a lot of sustainable development goals, Today, uh, we have this agenda, 2030 agenda, with these 17 sustainable development goals, and we have one specific regarding climate action, the SDG 13. This is also hand in hand working with the Paris Climate Agreement. This uh, agreement to try to combat, to fight uh, against the climate alterations and change the way we are living in order to achieve this. And all of this uh, going to the most recent uh, convention and, and conference about climate change. We have last year, the COP26, when was discussed uh, a lot of what we have to do and what we haven't did uh, already. So uh, in a simple way, uh, in, in, in the Paris Agreement and the today realities is that we uh, have uh, all the same scientists uh, regarding climate ha have created the representative uh, concentration pathways, the RCPs scenarios, that are the different futures that lie ahead. In the reality of, unfortunately, we are going to have a global uh, warm increasing. We, we cannot stop that now, but we can make changes in our ways of life in order to that increase are less or more. So these scenarios take into account an increase it on 1.5 uh, degrees or uh, two or three degrees. And for example, they establish in, in the panorama scenarios that these different uh, increasing of the degrees could be the difference on having two months average growth or 10 months average growth or also the wildfires. Uh, this is a, a sad reality that we have been seeing uh, in the past years. Uh, now in Portugal, we have more than 100 active uh, forest wildfires. And this uh, also will increase. We cannot avoid this, but we can uh, stop that the increasing has been a lot. And among other examples of these scenarios, so in this sense, UNESCO Global Geoparks have assumed a strong commitment to contribute in the fight against climate change because we are a network, a network with 177 uh, territories that in a local way can impact in a global way. So uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks can contribute to make the difference and in this sense, I have the, uh, the small but interesting case of Mixteca Alta UNESCO Global Geopark in Mexico and what they are doing to face this reality. Now, only to make a brief introduction of our geopark, we are in the south of Mexico in the Oaxaca state. It's a small territory but with uh, 400 square kilometers, but nine uh, municipalities 
And these uh, nine municipalities uh, are um, by traditional people, are indigenous communities, uh, so have a different kind of organization, but also a different kind of uh, um, relationship with Mother uh, Earth. The, the main motto, the, the star of our geopark is erosion. Uh, and erosion uh, caused this uh, geological formation, the Janwit land formation. Uh, and that's why the motto of our geopark is erosion, culture, and new heritage. And these are, are the different uh, landscapes that we can find and the different uh, erosive uh, landforms that some of them are quite beautiful like this, the herds. This is also a geocide called the Hertz, <laughs> but also we have a, a amazing, amazing panorama and, and, and sites to look to the different uh, geomorphological uh, features of erosion. And why this landscape? Uh, it's important uh, to, to understand that historically, uh, this territory was misunderstood uh, as a climatic and environmental disaster because all this erosion. But the reality is that uh, more recent studies have proved that this erosion is not due to the increasing of uh, agriculture that following the Spanish Congress in, in, in Mexico because was, uh, sometimes uh, this was the justification. The reality is that this erosion was a lot time before because the Janwit clan formation is made of a quite very erodible place. So it's uh, all the time it's eroded. So the erosion was previous all of this. But also this particular characteristics of this geology can help and has helped along the history for the inhabitants of Mixteca to build resilience to be resilient uh, uh, to combat the uh, hunger, but also in a way climate change, because uh, they start to do the lack of suitable land, they start to build uh, some cross-channel agricultural system of terraces where they modify streams intentionally by constructing a stone and rural that's designed to trap sediments of this genuine sand formation in order to make a control environmentally settled for the agriculture, for the different kind of, of uh, output, uh, agricultural crops. And uh, this, uh, the, the more uh, old Islam Bordos, these barriers, uh, has already more than uh, 3,000 uh, years. And a lot of these are still used, but not so that uh, the mixed tech people are recovering a lot of them and still building these Lama Bordos because it's the best way to keep the traditional agricultural function in order to be adapt to the climate. So in the building uh, Lama Bordos, geology and climate play a very important role. As you see, are these them that uh, retain the jungle land formation that is easily eroded? I think someone has the microphone open. <laughs> and as you can see, the Lama board system in Mixteca Alta, this is a satellite image, yeah, and it's only a quite small area, but this is all across the region. And it's quite nice to see if you look in detail, we have the hydrographic net, but it's all also built by all these terraces. It's really amazing. So this shows the way that the mystic people have been used, the geology features, the climatic features, the soil features in order to build resilience for them. And to look in a particular way, some examples. Uh, uh, in 2018, uh, when I was carried on my PhD, here in the UNESCO share, we made uh, some studies in different territories in Latin America. But uh, I will talk about Mixteca Geopark in order to look how the Geopark have been uh, contributing to the 
sustainable development goals. Uh, we work mm, through the different targets regarding the climate action. Mm -hmm. we, are, we focus on these targets that are related with strong resilience, but also capacity building, build knowledge, and create management plans to act uh, uh, if fight the climate change. Also, uh, one of the, um, the studies we carry out was to make a lot of questionnaires uh, to the local perception of the people in order to identify which one the priority SDGs for them to have a better quality of life, a better sustainable development, but also compare this with uh, how the Geopark had been contributing on the different SDGs. And it's quite interesting that uh, the SDG in 13 regarding climate action was in the top eight of priority SDGs. But on the opposite, the Geopark uh, has not contributed a lot in this SDG, has been carried on a lot of work. I will show uh, some examples, but the, the reality was identified that uh, it's a big challenge and we need to do more in our territory to contribute to this SDG. And another um, uh, activity we carried on there was a participative mapping workshops in order to identify different areas of action. And for example, these are the areas with more conservation and natural restoration policies and mixed out and geopark. And this is only an example I put here to look the contrast with the map regarding the areas more affected through the climate change. It's all the territory. It was really amazing in the workshops that all the people agree that all the territory has been more affected by climate change and all the territory need to build more resilience, need to act. So it's a priority for these people, for this territory. So in this sense, also it's really sad to mention this, but as I said before, this study was carried on in 2018. And in recent historic times, this territory uh, doesn't have wildfires. It was rarely to have. But in February 2021, uh, we have a, a terrible wildfire uh, that was uh, really sad because also uh, this growth rapidly. And uh, we are talking about communities that doesn't have the action plans and infrastructure. And they only combat the fire through take you, community work, where all the people make their efforts to combat, combat this. Uh, and was and have been really amazing that Mixtec uh, Alton Esco Global Geopark took this threat to turn into opportunity. Since the very first moment, they start to create um, seminars, panels of discussions about the experience and challenge about these forest fires and how to combat. They start to create workshops, capacity building, to understand the different realities and perspectives since the local people and how they live the forest fire, but also with the experts and how to act in, in a future situation was a really great. They start to mobilize all this effort to build resilience, to capacity building, to create plans for, for acting. And all of this involved also a lot of workshops to identify the threats, the opportunities, the strengths, on how to act and what resources they have in order to combat climate change and this kind of uh, risk disasters. And of course, one of the main strategies is also through education, use the geosites to understand that uh, climate change and the change of the climate have been passing since the beginning of the earth. It, 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 uh, so, it's important to raise awareness in this sense because understanding the past climate, we can uh, understand the present and near future in order to build the real signals. So we have a lot of geosites in the geopark that are these paleosols, these alluvial archives, when it's possible to identify and have a lot of interpretations on, on how the climate has been acting uh, on this, uh, on this territory. 
but also uh, it's a lot uh, a lot of times are involving the, the students the local communities to to know this this knowledge but we have also a lot of students of, of bachelor degree uh, masters and phd degrees working about these situations or, or, or regarding soils paleo soils and the different uh, dynamics of the climate in mixed agriculture and of course, also regarding the education and the actions we can take to avoid pollution, to avoid the, all, all the different activities that in sort of way contribute to the warming of the earth, we have um, today great initiatives on education about how to manage uh, the waste, how to separate the waste, how to make this. All of this is important to, to talk about um, Master in Science, Selene Eridiani, that is this the girl on the right side that has been a lot nice work with the children, but also with uh, uh, master students and among others uh, to help the communities. And also uh, have been promote a lot of um, seminars, discuss, uh, taking also the international days of different things like Earth Day, Environmental International Day, Water Day. And, it, and it's quite interesting because we put in discussion not only the scientific people, but also the local communities people and how they look these realities and how they can act in order to together in a networking, we can build a better strategies for the future. In this sense, it's also, uh, as I mentioned before, but it's commonly to the people start to rebuild these Lama Bordos to create new terraces for agriculture that can be more adaptive uh, in the bottom of valleys uh, and protect of the climate change. And also to say that it's also a techie work, a work of the communities uh, that is a work that it's not paid. And all of this also to maintain the uh, enormous biodiversity of maize, native maize, that it's important to conserve and preserve because it is a, a, a biological heritage for all the world. But also to mention that these people keep uh, using um, traditional agricultural practice in order to not be uh, pol polluent practices. And also they, always make a ritual asking permission to Mother Earth to make the agricultural activities to ask for a, a great year of all crops. So this also shows the respect of these communities to Mother Earth and also our practices that uh, promotes the caring and sharing uh, the planet Earth and of course trying to mitigate climate change. And as I said before, uh, uh, we have zero waste program that is a quite nice and active program promote initially by uh, Selene Eridiani, but also now has involved a lot of people of the local communities and the scientific and technical staff on Ixtecalda. We have here an initiative that was carried on uh, three days ago in a primary school when they make workshops in order to children understand the different kind of waste and how to separate and how to reuse some of them and different uh, activities. Also, uh, it's important to mention the good visual communication in this sense to, to make a good message constantly. So it's, uh, it's frequent that Mixteca Alta are making this kind of uh, infographics, information, to promote in the local people in, on good practices on waste management. And also the, in this program, uh, have been working a lot in workshops with the local stakeholders on avoiding the use of plastic uh, bags and all kinds of plastic. So all the local restaurants and, uh, and local uh, hotels and shops uh, now has this uh, motto that it's uh, put it in my in my own bag put it in my own box and also it say that it's better if you go there with uh, um, 
with box and bags made of uh, natural materials, uh, no, nothing that it has plastic. Also another of the great initiatives promoting the zero waste program is the different campaigns for collecting a different kind of waste. For example, last year was the waste clone that was focused mainly in electronics. Um, they collect a lot of uh, tons, I don't know the number, but in order to recycle and, and avoid pollution. So just to finish, um, it's important to note uh, the, that even the GFR has carried on a lot, the reality we're facing as a global uh, world, uh, we have a lot to do, it's still far away, but locally, if all the geopars we contribute to act, even if it's small, we can go further on this big challenge. And in this sense, maybe the next task Mr. Calda should focus is create detailed resilience and risk reduction plans in order to, we unfortunately, we are going to face more of these forest fires. So we have to be more prepared. Uh, also, it's important to continue strength and expand the zero waste program that has been a lot of success, but make more success of this. A strength capacity building to all the people, to all the communities. And the, for me, the biggest challenge is improve access infrastructures and emergency vehicles. This requires a lot of uh, economical resources that unfortunately in these communities is difficult to have but it's necessary to start find the ways to have this because without this, uh, the forest fires could be uh, terrible. So um, this is to finish or and I will only finish uh, thanking uh, a lot to all these people in the pictures that are the magnificent uh, Mixtec Alta team. Of course, here are not all the people, but, but maybe are the key uh, the key persons that make this dream continue alive and, and have carried on a beautiful work in Tech Alta UNESCO Global Geo Park. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Emaline, uh, for your presentation. It was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, there are a lot of people reacting uh, to your uh, presentation. Um, and uh, many considerations about. Unfortunately, we are already very late uh, in our program and we need uh, to go uh, further for, if someone wants to ask questions to Dr. Emaline, please send an email to, to her. Thank you, thank you so much, Emaline, for your uh, great presentation that was really different, but uh, focus on something very important and the, that you said in, in the beginning. So the, the, the erosion is the typical uh, situation in Mixteca uh, Alta, UNESCO Global Geopark and all the, how people was able to uh, react and become resilient to live uh, and to take advantage of this, um, this area. Uh, is uh, fantastic and thank you for sharing uh, this experience uh, to, to us. And uh, going further, uh, the next uh, presentation will be made by Professor uh, Cristina uh, Vega Pires. Uh, she is um, a professor at the University of Algarve uh, in Portugal, uh, is member of the Research Center for Marine uh, and Environmental uh, Research, um, is the executive director of the Life Science Center uh, of uh, Algarve, and she is the scientific director of the aspiring Algarvensis UNESCO Global Geopark, a new project that is under development uh, in, in Portugal. And today uh, she will uh, share with us a, a talk uh, titled Challenges of the Sun and Beach Tourism and Sustainability in Algarvensis Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cristina Vega Pires, for accepting uh, our invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you uh, with us. And uh, the floor is yours. 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for the, the invitation you, you made uh, to the Algarvense Aspiring Geopark. Um, I uh, hope there is not too much noise. I'm in a different space today with a lot of children around. So It's uh, perfect, it's perfect. So uh, yes, the, um, the challenge that has been given to me is to speak about challenges challenges of sun and beach tourism and sustainability in Algarvensis Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. Well, it is a very good subject. Thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, and uh, for speaking about that, I thought that I will start by the beginning. So let's speak a bit about the idea of this aspiring geopark. So first of all, of course, the discovery of a new species, a world reference geocide with this Metoposaurus algarvensis that has around 227 million years that was found in a region uh, in the Algarve. Then there was this um, very political regional consortium that get together with three municipalities and the University of Algarve um, that get together to construct a project, a project based on this new discovery and on the geology of the region, which was quite interesting. So of course, the natural way to go was to have uh, also an idea of which type of uh, strategy could help with sustainable development, geology, and nothing better than a UNESCO Global Geoparks for that. Uh, so yes, the main idea was for these municipalities was working together for this sustainable strategy. And here is the region. Here are two points uh, that are geological geosites or important ge geosites, sorry, of the region. And the three municip municipalities that get together are the three in the middle of this region. So this is the region of the Algarve. And as you can see on the south part, it is blue. And this is water. It is the Atlantic Ocean. This uh, region, this part of the region, has a very low density inhabitants in the inland part. And indeed, the municipalities and the University of Algarve wanted to have a sustainable strategic development strategy for this inner part, mostly. To have a new way of getting people to get there, having new uh, economic values and something to give a new birth to this region. So there was a dilemma and a challenge, the two faces of the Algarve region. The Algarve region is uh, in the southern part of Portugal here with a very uh, interesting uh, um, place uh, out near the Gulf of Cadiz and the Atlantic border on the west side. So we have very nice weather. Uh, it is a Mediterranean climate, so very nice, hot, uh, and with nice waters, not very warm, but enough for having this famous sun and beach region. So all the coast is quite nice. And if you look on the web and you will, uh, uh, search for the Algarve region, you probably will see this. So very nice cliff, uh, nice small pocket beaches, on, on the side, erosional uh, karstic uh, features, uh, sandy cliffs, lowlands with very nice lagoons and islands. And that's what is sell for uh, sun and beach. But the sun and beach in the Algarve also gets like that. So it means that uh, during the summer or the vacation period, the region, the population of the region is almost three times the normal population. And these, as you can see, the beaches are crowded. It is a very massive tourism that we get. And together with that, of course, um, the urbanization gets quite crazy. And we we'll have uh, along the shore, not only the really nice cliffs and geological feature that we I showed just before, but we also have these um, 
populated urban development that are uh, growing on, on the beach. The other side, the other Algarve, the inland part is more like that. So very small uh, uh, urbanizations, uh, a lot of uh, wild uh, region with several type of uh, landscape. Um, and we had to make a choice. So we wanted to have a strategy for sustainable development, but how do we get this sustainable development with two such construct, con contrasting environment, the inner area, the inner land and the littoral area. So in the inner land, we have the World Referential Site. We have a uh, huge geodiversity, but it is not exposed as along the, the cliffs. We have to search for them, to look for them, to, uh, uh, of course, uh, have a, a plan for conservation. The geological history is uh, huge. I will speak about that. We have a very long period of time. We can speak about several uh, chapters of uh, the Earth's history. The biodiversity is also very important with a lot of natural places recognized. Uh, there is an important cultural heritage with uh, human Roman prehistoric uh, places. And of course, as I already said, a very low human density, population density, and we are looking for uh, every year uh, uh, um, higher des desertification of the region, not only in terms of human, but also uh, the, the vegetation, the wildfires and the crops are abandoned. On the littoral area, we have a geological landscape that is outstanding because it is just exposed. Uh, and if we compare it to what is seen in the inner area, it is a complementary history, younger history. Uh, but it is contrasted, con contrasted by this uh, occupation, wild occupation, a lot of buildings, a lot of people, for which this massive tourism uh, has no very interest in, uh, in sustainability. Uh, and this is the sun and beach. So uh, the, the consortium had to take a decision of how to construct their strategy or our strategy uh, based on those two phases of the Dialga uh, uh, region. And there's, there is something else that has to be considered is that with climate change, those are the projections for the RCP uh, 4.5 and RCP uh, 8.5, uh, the changes in uh, temperatures uh, where we can see that the temperature is going to rise uh, and the number of days of heat waves will rise also very uh, important. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not yours, it shall be days. I just translated from Portuguese. So it means that the sun and beach is also going to be uh, each time more difficult because the, the heat and the climate for this summer, very short summer uh, period will be complicated. So we took a decision and we decided that the boundaries of this aspiring geopark should not uh, go until the, uh, the coastline uh, in order to really um, focus on this uh, specific characteristic of the inland. Uh, which has a huge value. And uh, we can tell a very nice stories and focusing on the, um, the same strategy for all these uh, uh, territory. Uh, but we do not leave completely the ocean. So although uh, as an aspiring geopark represented here, we are not going until the, the coastline. On the left side, we have Portugal with the aspiring geoparks that are almost all in the coastline and uh, already uh, uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks in the interior of the, the, the continental, Portugal continental, we still have a very uh, nice landscape, which uh, is divided in those three, uh, three, four different landscapes 
from the inner part towards the coastal region, but not reaching this coastal region. And this is very nice because if we look at it, the lithology is made of ancient oceans. So we have uh, all type of lithology that goes from uh, Rowex uh, until, uh, 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 sorry, uh, calcare, dolomites and uh, carbonates. And limestones. And so we have an history that actually it is a territory of inland seas, all geological inland seas that turn into uh, opportunities. So we go from the Rake Ocean to the Tethys Sea. We can speak about this ocean. And the idea is to speak about these and go towards the literal and pick up just the right persons that can help in the uh, sustainable development in different ways. So those different ways are people that will enjoy uh, local uh, gastronomy. We have some projects about uh, gastronomy and inclusive uh, local products, but also culture. We have now uh, uh, a project of every two years uh, having a cultural project that goes into uh, the inland and shows uh, different aspects of these uh, very nice geosites. So you can see here three, three different examples of cultural uh, projects that have been done. An exhibition here representing the old crops that used to be in the region. Here it is a representation in a salt mine underground. And here uh, this is a tapestry on uh, along the river that has been put. So the idea is really to pick up in the this huge amount of people that go to the to the coastal uh, part and bring them to these different aspects of the inland, proposing other type of activities such as uh, photographies, astronomical uh, observation, trekking, but also, of course, a lot of pedestrian trail, mountain bike. And of course, I told you about the climate change. So all these will be not concentrating in the summer part, of course, but in the rest of the year. So trying to uh, capture these people for uh, the other part of the year. And that's more or less how we want to get into sustainability, uh, looking at tourism. And one part that is important is that the, the tourism is national and uh, international. So we can have this, uh, this target, but also, of course, in education and uh, looking, trying to engage young people to go and develop new projects in this inner land. So how we see it is that we have a very nice territory of seas uh, sculpt, uh, in, sculpt uh, by fresh water that allows to tell several chapters in this history of planet Earth and hopefully uh, in opposition to the uh, uh, just sun and beach. So we want to have this territory for the people and with the people. That's what I wanted to tell you about our history and these uh, challenges with Sun and Beach just to be says. I cannot hear you, Arthur. I think. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Christina Vega Pires, uh, for your great presentation about this very interesting. Uh, project uh, for an aspiring uh, UNESCO Global Geopark in Portugal, and this view that in, in accordance the uh, the motto uh, of uh, this uh, this summer university, so oceans, people, and cooperation for sustainable development, uh, you brought us. Uh, a, a, a new vision it's, a, it's something that uh, is really uh, important uh, despite uh, that the the metoposaurus algarvins is the the fossil that uh, was in the origin of this project is related with the first uh, steps of the opening of the uh, north atlantic ocean uh, it's something very very interesting and it's uh, uh, another 
uh, another piece, another vision uh, on uh, uh, this intensive course that uh, up to now uh, was plenty of great presentations and uh, very, very, very good uh, examples. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for your presentation. I will open the floor only for one question if someone uh, wants to put a question to you. Well, you have already a, a lot of people uh, congratulating you, but you have uh, uh, here a question um, from Costa Quebrada. Thank you for your brilliant communication, Christine. Our aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark faces similar cha challenges. When defining your non-coastal territorial setting, did you, oops, uh, uh, did you consider the role of the amazing coastal Algarve in attracting the audience to the most rural inner areas? And thank you for the question. Yes, what we are doing in parallel is indeed uh, doing some uh, education and uh, information on some geosites on the coastal region uh, that will hopefully uh, get the attention of the people and putting this into the relation with the the, the geopark so it is not um, an entrance to the geopark but it's like very specific spots that people will want to uh, have more information about the geology of the region and then go to the geopark so yes there are some very specific points but we want to do the difference between the, the coast and the geopark indeed Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, it was an honor to us to have you with us. Uh, and now it's time to go to the, uh, the keynote uh, speaker of this morning, of the third day. It will be Dr. Azier Hilario, uh, my dear friend uh, Azier Hilario. Uh, he is the scientific coordinator of the Basque Coast UNESCO Global Geopark in Spain. Uh, is an observer member as IUGS representative in the uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks Council and in the G Global Geoparks uh, Network Executive Board. Um, he is also senior evaluator of the roster of uh, UNESCO Global uh, Geoparks. Is a recognized specialist in uh, geodiversity and geoconservation. Uh, he's made a lot uh, of uh, uh, research uh, uh, research studies about this and uh, is uh, the coordinator of the project IGCP 731 IUGS geological heritage site it's a very important um, project that uh, uh, we already talked here that is related uh, with the definition of the uh, geosites of international re relevance. He is, of course, a, a worldwide recognized authority in uh, UNESCO Global uh, Geoparks. And today he will share with us a keynote lecture titled The Memory of the Earth in the UNESCO Global Geoparks. Thank you so much, Azir, uh, for uh, the acceptation of uh, our invitation and uh, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank you. Really appreciate your invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be again in this fantastic, excellent, uh, uh, intense course. And thanks to all the team behind you that it's uh, this, uh, this course. So let's see if you can if you can see properly my my screen. Um, is it okay now? Uh, now you need to uh, yeah. enlarge. Yes, it's perfect. Okay. So well, uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk about basically to talk about my my passion. I would like to share with you some some ideas about the importance of the memory of the Earth in UNESCO Global Geoparks, or the importance of UNESCO Global Geoparks keeping the memory of the Earth and spreading the memory of the Earth to, to the general population. These are the main three ideas of my presentation. I would say that the world is changing very fast. Second idea is the memory of the Earth, that we need to reconsider our position on Earth. And the third idea is how UNESCO Global Geoparks putting people just in the front line uh, got to be a very successful initiative to work with the memory of the earth. So the world is changing fast. I would say that after millions of geological evolution and millions, thousands of 
ecological evolution and a few years of cultural evolution, uh, we got to live together quite okay, culturally, naturally, in quite a sustainable way up to, I would say, 50, 60, 70 years ago. In, and this is a good example of that in, in Lanzarote UNESCO Global Geopark. Everything seems to be more or less sustainable. Everything seems to be uh, okay. But at the same time, uh, we are sure that we are living in, in a quite a strange world. So just consider that uh, we are growing very, very, very fast. In the year um, 1900, we were only 1.5. Today, we are about 79 uh, billion uh, inhabitants on Earth, and we are expecting to be about 10 uh, billion inhabitants on Earth by, let's say, in the next decades. And more than that, today, about 50% of the population lives in big cities. And for the year 2050, it's expected that 70% of the people will live in big cities too. And this is something very, very important because it really limits the possibility for most of the people living on Earth to be connected to the nature, to be connected to the to to to, to the Earth. But well, that's fine. We have this. We have uh, this kind of beautiful shopping centers. Where is this picture taken? So it really doesn't matter. It could be Madrid. It could be Beijing. It could be Lima. It could be New York. And I would say that uh, globalization is making us more. Uh, similar. Uh, we all want to more or less dress the same kind of clothes. We more or less want to eat the same kind of food. We want to listen the same kind of music. So I would say that globalization is making us more and more similar in different parts of the of the world. And we also have our mobile devices. And this is also something very, very important. Um, we never got that connected as we are today. We have a very fast information. Whatever happens in the world, in the other part of the world, in just one minute, we will have that information in our pockets. We never had such a big amount of friends or digital friends or whatever they are, but such a big amount of people connected in in, in our pockets. And this fact, it's... it's uh, I would say that has deeply uh, um, changed the way that we live in, in our planet. In overall, I would say that as a general idea, I would say that it is normal that things change. But I would say that in the recent 20, 30 years, things are changing very, very fast. We are losing authenticity. We are losing identity. We are losing focus. And that would have not been a big major challenge that would have been just our problem if it wouldn't mean that uh, the way we are uh, staying on earth in the last decades is creating a very very strong impact and this can be seen in this very clear graph just by seeing the population worldwide the technology patents application and the affluence measure on gdp which is increasing very, very, very fast. Obviously, it is quite easy to understand that this is not sustainable. We need to reconsider our position on, on Earth. And that's why there is even, uh, let's say, a working group even within IUGS, which is uh, thinking about the possibility of defining a new uh, stratigraphical period called Anthropocene. I will not go into the detail of this uh, debate, which is very, very wide. But I think it's quite clear that our impact on Earth in the last two decades, three, let's say two, three, four decades, it's been as important as any of the big impacts on Earth history. So that is something important to, to be considered. And that is something that we can say that because we have the memory of the Earth. At the end of the day, I would say that we are losing clearly, we are losing connection with our mother earth, with our Pachamama. We are losing connection with our earth. And that's why we need to recover the memory of the earth. And the memory of the earth is one of the best tools that we have uh, to, let's say, try to reconnect, to get closer to, to, to our planet. We need to understand that the complexity of the earth system, we need to accept that we just arrived. And this is something very important that it's given by the memory of the earth. And we strongly need to reconsider our position on Earth. Let's be romantic. Uh, let's start for the easiest things. Let's be impressed by the beauty of the Earth. There are really fantastic places all around the Earth in which we can be, let's say, we can go in love. 
So let's be romantic. Let's be impressed. Let's be impressed by the majesty of big mountains. Let's feel small in front of these beautiful big mountains, which are a big piece of, of, uh, of, of art. But also let's be uh, impressed or let's enjoy simple landscapes. These are the, the, the let's say, simple mountains of the, of the Basque country. Uh, I grew up here. And I really love this, this, uh, these places because it, it brings very beautiful memories to me. But also because I know that when I'm walking through these foggy mountains, I'm walking above a coral reef that's, that was grew up about 100 million years ago in a, in a tropical sea. So this perspective of the memory of the earth really gives you the possibility to understand and enjoy not only majestic mountains, but also simple landscapes like, like this one here. I come for a very beautiful and small geopark, which is the Basque Coast UNESCO Global Geopark, in which we have this kind of geological formation, what we call flish. I usually say that this is like a big book on, of earth history, in which every of those layers are like the pages of the book. So I really know very well what, what, what the memory of the earth, the geological time means. Every step you take here, every layer means about 10,000 years. So I would say that in only three, four, five layers, uh, we can put the main history of our, of, of, our, of our ancestors. So there are really places like this where you can really appreciate what the deep time uh, means. UNESCO Global Geoparks are full of landscapes to admire full of places where, let's say, the time goes slowly. I had a chance to be in this place here in the Northwest uh, Highlands in, in Scotland, and staying here for about two hours, just sitting in front of this beautiful bay in a very unpopulated area. It was a very fantastic, it was a very, very, very good uh, experience. And it's something that you cannot, you cannot do in your, in, your, in your, let's say, daily, daily agenda. But also, I remember in that geopark, I had a very beautiful experience touching one of the oldest rocks on, on Earth. So having in my hands a rock, which is, I think it was like about 3.5 billion years old, that was a great experience. That rock has gone through most of the major events on Earth history, and you can have it in your hand. So we need to be able to transmit the passion about the memory of the Earth. But also the memory of the Earth it's showing us something very, very important, which I would say it's more philosophical than, than even scientific. It says that the geographies change, that the landscapes change, that nothing is forever. So everything is about time. So it is telling us that the beautiful landscape that we have in front of us, it's only the last slide of a much, much, much larger movie in which we just arrived. The mountain that we have in front of us used to be a sea or used to be a river or used to be different things. So landscapes and geographies change. And this is a very important philosophical idea, I would say, that uh, it's given by the memory of the earth. For example, we can see the roots of ancient mountains at the top of new mountains. This is, for example, in the Pyrenees, in Sobral by UNESCO Global Geoparks. And in the top of, the, of this beautiful mountain, we can see the roots of the Bariscan orogeny. The Bariscan orogeny which was, which was formed, uh, as, as you, most of you probably know, with the collision of most of the continents to give place to, to Pangea. Um, some of the biggest mountains on Earth history were built in that, uh, in that orogeny. But the memory of the Earth, it's also telling us that really the size of the mountains really doesn't matter. It's everything is a matter of time. Even the biggest mountains that have been ever built on the on Earth history has been eroded and has been disappeared, as you can see in these sediments. But also the memory of the Earth, it's not talking only about a very, very, uh, let's say, distant uh, past. We also need to understand that the process is still going on. Every time it rains, our mountains, our landscapes, our coastline, it's been eroded and the rivers are bringing sediments to the sea. So the cycle goes on and goes on and goes on. So being able to understand that we are living on a dynamic planet where things are happening all the time, usually slowly, that's also a very beautiful point of view to be on Earth. But also geoparks are very good places in which the memory of the Earth, the memory of the Earth, 
it's showing us that we live in a very dynamic earth. And sometimes dynamic means dangerous. And sometimes dangerous means that uh, it, there can be lives in risk. So UNESCO Global Geoparks to really work on training for to face this this kind of, of natural risks. This is, for example, in 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 Katla in, in in Iceland. Also, the memory of the Earth. It's a key issue to understand history of life. To understand that life, it's very very long. That life has the history of life has been very very complex. And to understand how life has been adapting to different circumstances, how life has been adapting to places like very deep seas, for example, like like here, in which there was not even nothing to it, but life was able to adapt, creating this kind of very very strange uh, uh, trace fossils and also the geological uh, heritage the memory of the earth it's telling us that sometimes the life has been dramatic and we all geologists we know that there are at least five big mass extinctions on earth this is for example from a geopark we have uh, the fifth big mass extinction so the end of the cretaceous the big ma the big extinction of dinosaurs or so the kt boundary which is recorded in a very very thin layer which is about two or three millimeters it's black and in that layer we can see that about 80 percent of biota of the biota on earth disappeared so we can also by studying the memory of the earth we can also understand that life has been complex and during life history we also had some let's say uh, important uh, dramatic events that we can see, for example, in these very small drops of melted material that came directly from the big impact that we had in, in Mexico, in Yucatan, that created that big mass uh, extinction. So the memory of the Earth is also a, a very good tool to connect us, to connect different places on, on Earth, because usually we cannot understand, we cannot make a good interpretation of a geological site if we are not if we are not able to compare it with different sites that we can find in many other UNESCO global geoparks that's why the big network of UNESCO global geoparks it's so so useful also for for research but also the memory of the earth when we are talking about the memory of the earth on UNESCO global geoparks it's not only related to geological processes it's also related to human being and there are very very good anthropo and anthropological um sites in many UNESCO global geoparks that allow us to understand how humans arrived on earth and how humans has been evolving to reach uh, to this to this uh, uh, um, to this last situation or well, I think my presentation doesn't work now I'm sorry about that um, yeah in this moment is uh, seems froze yeah, it's uh, like frozen. Tr uh, try to switch off and enter again. Yeah, I will. I will. Oh, oh I'm. Um, yeah. I'm sorry about this. No problem. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> we are not the first. Uh, 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 We, we we can try to shut down in uh, shut down the, the sharing. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. But it looks yeah. like yes, I already done. Okay. Try now. Try to connect again, please. Okay. Uh, yeah. No, I I can do I can do that now. Okay. I know what happened. I think it was my. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Win? Please, yes, please enlarge. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it was my PowerPoint. Yeah, some happened. Uh, it's not enlarging, correct? Well, okay. So, 
try to find more or less the number. I'm sorry about this. Uh, uh, let me just. You, you can use what without enlarging. So you finish the PowerPoint is the, what it matters. Okay. And now. And um, yes. Okay. I think I can go now. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Don't uh, worry. Can you see my screen, Arthur? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yes. well, I, will, I, will, I was telling that um, the memory of the Earth is giving us ideas about not only uh, geological processes uh, that well, are, let's say, uh, okay. uh, hidden in, 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 in the deep time, but also about a human being, also about our ancestors and how humans arrive on Earth and evolve in the last thousands of years. And that is giving us a very good uh, point of view of which is our position on Earth. There are some places on Earth in which our impact is absolutely strong, like for example, this one here and many other cities on, on, on Earth. And related to that, we all know that we are in front of a global change, not only climatic change, but we are in front of a, of a global change. And the memory of the Earth is a crucial, it's a very important tool that we need to analyze in order to be able to let's say understand which is the real challenge of, of, uh, of, of, of global change. Climate change is part of this global change. And there are fantastic places, fantastic sites in many UNESCO global geographies, like for example, this one in, in, in Italy, in which we can see very well how the glaciers has been shrinking and getting smaller and getting smaller and getting smaller. But also if we go, if we go to, to the Nordic countries, there are a lot of uh, geoparks in which we can see how the glacier landscape, how the big glaciers uh, used to erode completely uh, the northern part of, of Europe in, in this case. So uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks are also telling us that during the last ice age, which is only about 20,000 years uh, ago, the landscape used to be really, really different. And the difference in temperature was not that important. But also in the memory of the Earth, it's telling us that uh, during Earth history, there has been also a very important and dramatic and extraordinary warming events. Like for example, between the Paleocene and the Eocene. The Paleocene, Eocene, Eocene thermal maximum uh, was due also to greenhouse uh, eff uh, effect. And according to the opinion of most of the, of the investigators, this is probably the best example that we have in the geological record to understand how the system, how the climatic system or the earth system could evolve in the in the next decade. So understanding the past can really give us very useful tools to understand the present and also to face the future. Related to this climatic change, we all know that one of the most important impacts are going to be the sea level variations. There are a lot of coastal UNESCO global geoparks where we can see how the sea level has been going up and going down according to this, um, to this uh, climatic uh, variations. And not only that, we can also understand how life has been beautifully adapted to this normal and natural sea level variation. So really by understanding how the sea level has been adapting to the climate, climatic changes and how life has been adapting to all these variations in a natural way, give us the real context to understand that uh, the global change or climate change in this case it's something extraordinary. When we talk about climate change, when we say that climate change is going to be one of the most important challenges that we have. We need to explain why climate change is extraordinary. Why climate change is, let's say, out of the natural variations on, on Earth history. And the memory of the Earth is a key issue to understand this point. So in according to that, we, we really need to uh, wonder ourselves which is going to be our position in the next uh, in the next decades. So I really believe that UNESCO Global Geoparks have one of the keys to, let's say, um, make this memory of the Earth closer and spread the memory of the Earth to, to the general population. So somehow helping people visiting and living in UNESCO Global Geoparks to be more connected and to understand better how the how the, the Earth system works. At the moment, we are, as you very well know, 177 UNESCO Global Geoparks in 46 uh, countries. 
And this big achievement was got only in about 22 years. And this is a great adventure. This is a great, great achievement. Obviously, I will not talk about this, but obviously you know that UNESCO Global Geoparks are aligned with, uh, with, um, with the Sustainable Development Goals. But I would like to give you some, some very good proofs of, of this and how UNESCO Global Geoparks brought together the memory of the earth and the memory of the people living in those territories that are connected to the memory of the earth. Geoparks are territories of people. Geoparks are territories where a lot of people live. Geoparks are territories of culture. I speak Basque. I'm part of the Basque culture and I'm very proud out of speaking one of the oldest language, languages in, in Europe. Geoparks are territories of education. Most of the geoparks do have geo schools. Most of the geoparks do really care about the children. So therefore, geoparks are really territories with future. No future can be built without education. Geoparks are also territories with an ongoing training, creating new opportunities and creating new visions for, 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 for people living in, the, in, in, in these territories. And geoparks are territories that usually do things that are not very common in this globalization context. Geoparks give value to local products. And this is something that it's not that, that, uh, that, that, that common. But for visitors, geoparks are territories to explore. And this is something very special. I would say that today uh, that we have internet connection everywhere, uh, we have lost the possibility to, let's say, surprise people when they come to your territory, because in most of the cases, people have already seen many pictures from the places that, that they are traveling to. But we have something that we cannot show in any picture. We have the beautiful stories of the memory of the earth. We have to be able to surprise people by telling them which is the beautiful story of the memory of the earth written in our beautiful landscapes like the one we have uh, here. Our geoparks are full of beautiful stories that must be told, that must be disseminated among general population. Geoparks are territories of proudness, and this is very important. Linking local people to their memory of the earth, to their geological heritage, makes them feel proud of being part of that geopark, makes them feel proud of being part of a UNESCO designation. Geoparks obviously are territories of science and territories of conservation. We do have the responsibility to, to take care of the memory of the, of, of the earth. Geoparks, and just to finish, are a beautiful program that really does networking. We are connected. We are a kind of a big memory. We discuss. We are connected. We meet each other. We share a lot of, uh, a lot of experiences. So that's why I would say that geoparks are a quite uncommon initiative. And that's why I pro probably geoparks has been uh, so successful. I would say that, uh, just permit me this, uh, if you say, if you want romantic view, but I would say that geoparks, the 177 geoparks distributed in 46 uh, countries, if I'm not wrong, are really lighthouses for a better, for a better future. Geoparks are basically territories of passion through the memory of the earth. Geoparks are territories in which the memory of the earth connect our passion through our landscapes. So with this, thank you very much. I just wanted to share with you how uh, the memory of the earth can be that important to bring people uh, connected to their landscapes and to bring people connected to their territories. Thank you. Wow, Azie, what a great, a great presentation. What a keynote, uh, fantastic. Uh, you can see all, all the people already uh, reacting uh, to it. So uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, with us this this vision. That uh, many times it's important that uh, to, to to have this vision, this connection uh, <clears throat> with the earth when we talk about uh, about the geoparks. In this, what um, was perfect and matched perfectly the others um, presentations made during uh, this uh, this morning. So for sure that someone uh, have uh, questions uh, to Dr. Uh, Azie Hilario, I will open the floor. Uh, so please don't be shy and put questions for sure. Azie uh, will have a pleasure to answer you. Someone? Well, 
well, the, the, there are a lot of people present uh, here and uh, from a lot, a lot of countries. Um, well, it seems that <laughs> was very impressive. People, people don't don't keep questions to uh, to to put to to you. You have a, a lot. Let's see in the chat. It's all, only people thanking you uh, and congratulating you for your brilliant presentation. Yeah, may I ask a question? Yes, Tan Utun, please. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, your presentation is very quite interesting and uh, th that is the, the one which I'm so much interested subject because your geopark is also we really are considered just like a memory of the art. I agree uh, with, and I also uh, interested the, the subject. So uh, your, your presentation is quite, uh, a, a quite wide end, all the perspective, uh, including uh, with the geopark. And also, uh, how about you, the, this geopark concept is, uh, uh, do you mean the, we can, we can encourage or inspire our young generation for conservation of our art? I want to know your comments. Thank you. Um... That's, well, that's a good question and a very complex uh, a question for which I do not have uh, a correct answer for sure. Uh, because younger generations are um, very heterogeneous in different parts of the world and even very heterogeneous in my own geopark. Uh, I have to accept that in, even in our geopark in which let's say that the geological heritage is so spectacular and so easy to understand, uh, even in, in places like this, um, making your younger generations um, participate in our activities, it's a big challenge. That's, that, 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 that's a real thing. Um, I do not really agree with the general idea of getting messages uh, too simple uh, in order to reach and to approach and to get better to, to younger generations. I don't think that's, uh, usually when you, when, when you talk with, a, with an expert on communication and you say, you tell them, okay, I want to, I want to, to, to approach younger generations. So, so usually the, the, the first, the, the first uh, proposal is going to be, okay, you have to work with social networks, you have to work with Twitter and Instagram and blah, blah, blah. And you have to get your symbols, your messages very, very, very simple, very short and, and yeah, things like that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that's that's the format. But uh, the only reflection I can do is the format is important, but the content is much more important than the format. Yeah. So uh, let's let's don't forget that. Let's use the proper format, but let's yeah. don't forget that uh, the thing that it's making us different. It's not that we are uh, light. We have a lot of good stories to tell, and let's not simplify our message too much. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. well, I did not respond to you, but I, it's just a reflection that, that based on, on, on yeah, personal experience. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Tan Tun. Uh, some more questions? You can, uh, you can contact me by email if you want. I will be very, very happy to whatever yes, I, I, will. yes I, will. I, I will i will i want to reach uh, all the some, some papers from you yeah thank you i will enjoy i will join you later great so someone it seems that someone wants to make the, another question yes i'd like to make a question uh, yes, and then Daria, Daria Deva. yes please uh, yeah, good good day uh, so hello good morning good afternoon hi daria um, uh, last year, I participated in the summer school, yes. uh, and uh, I um, wrote an email uh, to you, to you, uh, Doctor Essier, about the methodology of assessment of um, geosites. Uh, in uh, so the, the unique methodology which uh, connects all the methodologies that we have now. 
uh, in um, in printed so not not in print. So I have found a lot of message methodologies by Brilla and some other authors, um, which helps us uh, to understand which geocide geocide is necessary to include in our geopark and which is important and uh, which is not. Uh, so and you've said that there is a um, methodology that uh, you want to make uh, that will connect all the methodologies and will be um, the general, I, I could say, methodology for all the geoparks that we can use. So did you, uh, did, did you make such kind of uh, methodology, maybe? Uh, well, no, I don't, I don't really think I said that, or I didn't mean to say that, but I, but I, but I, will, but I will reply to you. Um, yes, it is true, there are a lot of different methodologies that has been published by different authors during the last, let's say, 20 years or even more. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for example, in our geopark in, in the Basque Coast, we created our own methodology, something very, very simple, much simpler, simpler than, much more simple than, than most of the methodologies that have been published. Uh, and I know that uh, many geoparks, but the, the only problem is that our methodology is only in Spanish. I would be very happy to share it with whoever is interested, but it's only written in, in Spanish. But basically, it's a very it's a simplification of uh, different methodologies that have been published during the last 20 years. Why? Because, um, and, and I, I know that a lot of people have been, uh, different geoparks have been inspired by this methodology. Because I do understand that in most of the cases, uh, these methodologies that have been published uh, from the, let's say, academic uh, view, um, are too complicated to be used by most of uh, the people who is involved in UNESCO Global Geoparks at the beginning, or at least in aspiring UNESCO Global Geoparks that usually do not have the expertise and experience to use this kind of, in most of the cases, complex methodologies. So what we did is we created something very simple, very natural, uh, which gives you a quantitative analysis, semi-quantitative analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we did. We created our own methodology, something very simple. And I know that it has been exported to different uh, geoparks. I made a, a publication on that, but it's again in, in Spanish. I will be very happy to, to, to share it uh, with you mm -hmm. uh, if you are interested on, on, on that. Uh, once I have said that, uh, I do understand that using methodologies for the assessment of the geological heritage, it's something that can be useful. Mm -hmm. But let's don't understand that like the real truth. Uh, geological heritage, um, political human realities are much more complex than what you can put into a complex formula. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. You can use the methodology that you want, but don't take that as the real truth. That's mm -hmm. not the, 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 the word of God. Mm -hmm. No. You are the one who has to identify you. I mean, if you are working in a geopark, you are the one that should be able to identify which are the main sites of your geopark and which are the main sites to be used for scientific to, uh, purposes, the main sites to be used for educational purposes, or the main sites to be preserved. And then if you want, you can use these methodologies. And these methodologies are going to give you a number that probably will confirm your thoughts about the geological heritage of your territory. Mm -hmm. But I would say no more than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I... I, I really defend these methodologies, but let's not take them like the real truth. It's not the word, the word of God. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And in any, in any case, my invitation would be to read more than one and try to adapt them to your reality, to your geopark, to your territory, to your purposes, to your goals. What do you want to get with your inventory? So 
get good ideas from different methodologies and create one that would fit better to you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do this. I can, I mean, you can contact me if you want. Uh, and I can share with you, I can, I can share the one that we created. And, and then, I mean, if that can be inspiring to you, I'm, I will be happy. Thank you. Arthur, we cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Azie, because uh, I, I agree entirely with you, and I think that is the right approach. Uh, because it's important to be aware that uh, we are trying to uh, artif uh, create uh, something that is artificial related to something that is natural. So. Uh, a, a methodology, it will be always our vision about something that is natural and is difficult to, uh, to quali quantify something that is uh, natural. So I agree entirely with, with your view. Thank you. Uh, about, uh, I don't know if someone uh, have uh, another question. Well, uh, if no, no more questions, uh, I want to thank you so much once again, uh, as it was a great, a great uh, keynote um, in this uh, event. Thank you once again for your participation in this summer university. Yes, you stay with us since uh, the first edition. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to have you with us and many of the attendants already waiting. Uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, it was an honor to have you with us. And now it's time to do uh, a small break uh, for breakfast, for lunch or for dinner, depending the place in the world uh, where you are attending us. Uh, now uh, in 45 minutes sharp, we will start the uh, afternoon, uh, evening, uh, late morning, uh, session of, of this uh, of this sixth edition of the International Summer University on Geoparks, Sustainable Regional Development, and uh, Healthy Lifestyles. Thank you to all of you uh, for your attendance. Uh, and in 45 minutes, we'll be here uh, again to start the uh, last part of this uh, <coughs> intensive course. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of those that uh, shared with us uh, the keynotes of this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, everybody. A pleasure. Uh, uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you. See you then. Good afternoon, Ishan from Afghanistan, another country that joins us. Uh, so in this moment already people attending people from 54 countries in the world. It's fantastic. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, Arthur, for the nice uh, program and nice presentation. I'm very sorry I didn't attend the uh, first and second day of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ishan. Thank Bye.
Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's time to to return from the the break, uh, and now it's my time. Uh, it's my time to to talk about to talk with you about something that is uh, very important, that is structured. Uh, for any uh, geopark that is about networking. So uh, in this sense, I will try to share my... Yeah. Okay. I decided to title my presentation as Networking Between Coastal and Island Geoparks More Strategic Than Ever. In, in effect, um, when, we're talking, we, when we talk about uh, geoparks and to belong to the Global Geoparks Network, uh, is the, we are asking to become uh, a nut of this network. So uh, talking about UNESCO Global Geoparks is talking about territories when the motto is celebrating Earth's heritage, supporting the local communities. Uh, this is uh, in the site of UNESCO, you have a, a PDF when uh, that you can make the free download uh, and uh, uh, you can find many aspects related about the geoparks and one of them one of the structural uh, pillars of any geopark is uh, the uh, networking it's very nice because uh, in the in the front page we have a picture uh, when we can see uh, a small uh, package of salt from the uh, the Tetis, uh, the, an, an ancient ocean already disappeared, but that the salt that produces during the existence of this uh, uh, paleo ocean uh, is today exploiting the, in the Subbeticas UNESCO Global Geopark in the south of Spain, uh, and uh, was used as picture uh, on this. But in fact, the four essentials of any UNESCO global geoparks are one, geological heritage of international value. So today uh, we saw um, <coughs> several presentations uh, and the, also in the, the previous days about, about this reality, the reality of the geological heritage, the importance of the geological heritage, the recognition of the value of the geological uh, heritage, but also the management. The management is fundamental because we need to act over the uh, territory. Also visibility, visibility is a key issue. We need to communicate, we need to uh, show what we are doing, the results of our uh, work and Finally, but not less important, or even uh, most important, networking, the cooperation to share ideas, to share experiences, to share examples of good practices. And in effect, uh, when we, need, we have uh, a UNESCO Global Geopark, or we are developing um, <clears throat> a project to become a uh, UNESCO Global Geopark, we are looking to a territory when we have hidden treasures about the evolution of the planet Earth or even about the evolution of the life on the planet Earth. And the total of the UNESCO Global Geoparks if we visit all of them, we will keep a very impressive, uh, impressive idea about the uh, 
<clears throat> the history of the planet Earth or about the history of the evolution of the life in the planet Earth. So discover Earth's hidden treasures are one of the challenges that uh, the UNESCO Global Geoparks uh, put to all of those that uh, uh, goes to visit these uh, places. Uh, of course, that the, the motto of this uh, intensive course uh, is Oceans, People, and Cooperation for Sustainable Development. And uh, essentially focused on the, uh, the reality that we, we are now in the decade of the ocean sciences. Um, and uh, many of our uh, work is focused must be uh, focused also in the oceans and the reality of the oceans. And uh, during the, uh, the last uh, United Nations Ocean Conference uh, that uh, was held in Lisbon uh, from 27 June to 1st of July, um, was approved or was produced uh, a declaration, a, a declaration that you can uh, download in the web page of the United Nations. Uh, there are published in, the, in all the, the official languages uh, of, of the United Nations. Uh, and uh, many of the, uh, the aspects that are in sight uh, is about our ocean, our future, our responsibility is the, the name of the, the, the declaration. Uh, and uh, was one of the reasons why uh, we are talking about oceans on this. And um, during this time uh, uh, was produced by the UNESCO, UNESCO chair on oceans and coastal and insular and sustainable development in oceans and, uh, uh, and coastal areas of, uh, of the Aegean University in, in Greece, uh, a brochure that you can also make the download uh, of the PDF about the geoparks and oceans. And it's very interesting to see, and already uh, in the first day, uh, some colleagues uh, talking about that the, uh, there are many uh, geoparks uh, related with this. But today, we already uh, had another vision that uh, Professor uh, Xiao Xi Jin um, <laughs> shared uh, with us uh, and uh, um, any the, the majority of the uh, the geoparks um, have connections with the oceans or the present day oceans or the past oceans and this is very important because this allows us to uh, understand properly the importance of the, the, the oceans today and what they can help us in the future as resources in the, uh, the because the oceans are the engines of the, the, the weather. Uh, we need to understand um, better uh, this process in order to understand the importance uh, to preserve the good conditions uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the oceans. Well, but talking about networking, um, I will talk about um, uh, a project that uh, recently uh, we developed. Uh, was <coughs> we closed the, the project very recently? Was the project Atlantic Geoparks, uh, and uh, this kind of projects allow us to establish uh, or to reinforce a network. Uh, of uh, cooperation among uh, spatial territories located in the Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic area, in, in Portugal, in Spain, in France, in the United Kingdom, and in uh, Ireland. And uh, uh, these allow us to uh, develop new new knowledge, but at the same time help to stimulate and to reinforce innovative attitudes towards these uh, territories. Uh, was uh, a project that one of the main uh, achievement was the European Atlantic Geotourism Route. 
Um, this uh, European Atlantic uh, geotourism uh, route that is in this moment uh, in, a, in process uh, of uh, uh, formal classification by the, um, the Council of Europe uh, that uh, uh, if, if approved will be something at the same level of uh, the uh, Caminos de Santiago, the St. James, uh, James route uh, that is worldwide famous, and the other routes that uh, uh, we have in, in Europe. Uh, and this uh, will be a, a, a friendly and appropriate material for, that will help in the dissemination and promotion of these uh, territories. Not only those that were involved in the project, but also all those that in these areas are related with the uh, Atlantic uh, uh, dynamic. So uh, these uh, um, European Atlantic geotourism route uh, helped us to create synergies with a focus on the territorial uh, dynamics and also the promotion uh, helping uh, or based on the involving of the territorial agents of development uh, and at the same time facilitating a national and international project projection and recognition. This is the typical situation that uh, results from a networking cooperation. A geopark is not, is not an isolated institution in the territory. A geopark acts in a network uh, with all the other territories uh, trying to complement and to reinforce uh, their uh, heritage values, their natural and cultural uh, values. Uh, so uh, networking should be understood as a permanent activity of a territory classified as UNESCO Global Geopark and should become an implicit task in its ongoing decision-making processes. Is, is a question of a step-by-step -step process or like the picture, uh, stone by stone uh, process. We need to build up new things, new ideas, new projects every day in each geopark, but also in the network. So we need to put our knowledge, not only at the, at the service of our territory, but of the, the service of the entire Network. This is why, this is why uh, all the <clears throat> every time that uh, an evaluator, uh, an advisor, uh, a colleague from other geopark with more experience go to a territory and help uh, those that are working there to see different aspects and many times to give the right value to their efforts and to their, uh, their works and initiatives. This is very, very important. Uh, why? Because uh, the UNESCO Global Geopark not only refers to cooperation with the local population living in the, in the area of each geopark, but also refers also to the cooperation with others, UNESCO Global Geopark through the Global Geoparks Network. It was the case of this beautiful picture taken recently uh, when uh, <clears throat> that it was in uh, in Netherlands, in the Onchrook uh, UNESCO Global Geopark that together with the Terra Vita UNESCO Global Geopark from Germany was, they are uh, territories very, very close. But this was uh, an event of the uh, European, uh, <coughs> European Geoparks Network, but also a contribution for the Global Geoparks Network. So, and networking is this, is to come, is to discuss, is to see, is to discuss, is to exchange, is to create, is to imagine. So all this together, and of course to see, because all the friends and the, it's a few minutes ago, um, a colleague from Brazil uh, asked me when we return to the face-to-face -to -face, uh, 
in, in, in uh, summer university. I hope that the next year could be already possible uh, because it's despite the fantastic number of people that are inscribed in this course and the fantastic number of nationalities, the face-to-face -face contact helped us many times to clar clarify ideas, um, to imagine better situations. And uh, of course, it is important uh, this kind of, uh, of webinar. And today, the technology allows us to be uh, like in this moment, talking from uh, for the entire world. But the personal contact is also very important. However, however, there are another uh, aspects that we need to take into account uh, a little bit further in my uh, presentation. So uh, the regional networks um, of uh, UNESCO Global Geopark, in order to learn from each other and in a network, contributes to improve the quality of the UNESCO Global Geopark designation. Uh, it's very, uh, it's very important. Uh, for example, and was something that we we learned uh, deeply uh, with this uh, Atlantic Geoparks uh, project, uh, because all those involved discover that we have a lot of things that are similar and there are synergies that we can use to boost uh, our uh, initiatives the recognition the value uh, that even the economic advantages that we can take from from this so um the same uh, happened uh, with uh, colleagues involved in uh, huge project, uh, European project, uh, the Ruritage, uh, named Heritage for Rural Regeneration, that was a, a project in, that involved 38 partners from 18 countries and recently um, have the closed uh, session that happened in the UNESCO headquarters uh, in Paris. So is this kind of uh, involvement uh, of the elements of the network that we need to uh, to uh, to incentivize uh, to become more uh, more and more uh, important and another example the the new geo tour uh, another interreg uh, not from the Atlantic but the the new transnational program um, that was a very also a very nice uh, project involving geoparks from Central Europe and. Um, they uh, also find uh, new uh, uh, synergies to share among them. Um, uh, at the present, we have 177 UNESCO Global Geoparks in 46 countries. Is this the, the size of our network? We have already 177 uh, territories working together, working for common purposes. Uh, not only, not only the protection of uh, the uh, geological heritage, but much more involving all the, in this holistic approach that characterizes the uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks and uh, uh, <clears throat> contributes to the development of uh, geoparks all around the world. Well, look, uh, it's like uh, a, a geopark in Japan uh, develop uh, example of good practices. And this is also used by a geopark in Brazil, right in the antipodes, so the, the other side uh, of the world. Uh, and this is the kind of advantage that we take from the networking. Uh, so uh, we must be aware that the GGN was founded in 2004 uh, and is a dynamic network where the members are committed to work together, exchange ideas of good practices and join in common projects to raise the quality standards of all products and practices of UNESCO Global Geopark. This is the core business of 
any geopark. Any territory that applied to become a UNESCO geopark needs to assume these. Uh, and uh, why? Because uh, also, for example, uh, we, we need to meet, we need to discuss, we need to share. Uh, and this is an example of the, what I'm saying uh, until now. Uh, for example, this is uh, a picture previous COVID-19 pandemic was uh, a meeting uh, in the Burren and Cliffs of Moher uh, Geopark in Ireland, uh, when all the delegates uh, from the European Geoparks Network met and discuss um, a lot of ideas, a uh, lot of, str of, of strategies, and discuss the work done in the working in the working groups. Uh, but uh, these meetings are crucial. In this moment, we are discussing about if it, uh, we will open, uh, and uh, the next meetings will be already entirely presential or uh, in a mixed. Um, <clears throat> a mixed way, but uh, it, it is important that at least once uh, we can uh, stay face to face, of course, if it is possible in accordance with the, the rules uh, at the moment uh, related to the, to the health conditions, because as you know, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, when appeared, change many of, of these. And this is why uh, recently uh, the GGN uh, published, or several members of the, the GGN published a paper uh, when uh, we um, when we give some ideas for a kind of roadmap about, about the, the future how to act in the geoparks in the future. What already changed with the COVID-19 pandemic and what are the, um, the solutions for the future? Not only in terms of health, public health, but also in terms of environmental impact. Environment impact uh, at uh, all the levels in the planet and our commitment also to contribute for the uh, reduction of uh, the, uh, the factors that uh, contributes for the climate change. Um, we are looking now for two uh, big uh, meetings. The, uh, 16th uh, European Geoparks Conference that will be held in Italy uh, from 26 to 30 uh, of September in the in the Sessia Valgrande UNESCO Global Geopark and also in the Asia Pacific um, Geoparks uh, Network the seventh meeting uh, seventh symposium that uh, will be held from 4th to 11th of September in the Satun UNESCO Global Geoparks in Thailand. Um, of course, that <laughs> networking uh, implies also working together across borders. And this is the case, uh, a, a famous case here um, from the, the Geopark, formerly known as Marble Arch Caves, now it's the Lakeland. Um, geopark in uh, in between Northern Ireland in United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland, uh, and uh, doing do this, geoparks contributes to increase understanding among different communities, and as such, help peace building process. In effect, <clears throat> this transborder uh, geopark helped to find the peace in Ireland. That was a war that many of us don't uh, hear about, but finished uh, in, the, in, in 2008. Uh, and many of the good aspects result for the action of this transborder geopark. And more recently, with the Brexit, the border in between North United Kingdom and the uh, European Union, so uh, uh, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, 
uh, keeps to, uh, today open. Uh, one of the reasons, among many others, of course, is the existence of this uh, geopark. So a very good contribution for the um, SDG 16 of the uh, Agenda 2030. Similar situation uh, in between um, Hungary and uh, Slovakia, uh, the geopark of no Novograd, Novograd um, when uh, this allows to connect the people the, uh, the, of the forest, uh, of the, sorry, of different countries and fostering regional and transboundary co cooperation. This is cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. And, is essential uh, among uh, geoparks and another contribution for another uh, SDG, the SDG 17 partnerships for the goals is probably the SDG that appears everywhere, but this is an effective contribution for this uh, SDG. And the focus of the networking is also on the development and the global diffusion of the global geoparks network. We are working all together on this to reinforce the visibility, to reinforce the recognition, to reinforce the value uh, and the importance of these uh, territories. So it's mandatory, it's absolutely important that uh, we work um, all together uh, in permanent uh, connection. And here, an example of the, uh, in the ITB uh, fair uh, in Berlin, in the, the stand of the Aroka Geopark, uh, talking about our uh, networking project uh, in the interreg Atlantic area, so the uh, Atlantic Geoparks. Uh, there are some key, uh, some key uh, uh, guiding principles. For example, to manage UNESCO Global Geopark as an holistic uh, concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. All together working uh, and, act, uh, and, uh, and uh, producing networking, we keep the principles. We understand the importance to keep the principles of protection, education, and sustainable development in these territories. This is something very important. Like also like to, uh, this allows to give local people a sense of pride in their region and also to strengthen their identification with the territory. This is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and uh, this is only possible if we keep all together not alone, not isolated, but all together uh, working for the same goals. Uh, and also uh, helps to find the new sources of income. Meanwhile, the geological heritage of the territory is protected. So it's to look at the territory as a whole in a holistic approach, not only the geological heritage, not only the uh, the natural heritage, not only the cultural heritage, but all together, and even with the new ideas, the new visions of the world that many times <laughs> are the young generations that bring these. Uh, so the, another pillar is the involvement and the realization of sustainable development projects. For example, we saw uh, yesterday a very good example that uh, Ms. Constantina Ventana uh, shared with us about the reality uh, of the women cooperatives in uh, Lesbos uh, Island, UNESCO Global Geopark, but also another in um, Berlin and Cliffs of Moher uh, in, in Ireland, when uh, the, especially the ladies uh, produces uh, hot coffee and the hot tea and some cookies and the local bread and uh, uh, furnish this to the tourists and help them to, su uh, to support some uh, um, very fr uh, freeze conditions during uh, uh, the the autumn or winter time uh, in the territory because it's in near the ocean and they uh, are very windy and this is ve very good and this helps a lot uh, also to the local uh, economy. It's also the sense of belonging of the values of the territory. Like this uh, gaucho, uh, it's a, uh, this, this man dresses 
traditionally uh, and uh, like keeping the tradition of those that um, conduct the, the cattle from uh, the, the mountain to the lowlands uh, near, the, near the ocean and keeps the tradition and have proud of this. And this is a kind of example that we can um, we can share with other territories that can find similar um, similar traditions or similar people and and create also or nominate also the the living treasures of the territory. It's the kind of these men is a living treasure of the uh, uh, the paths of the South Canyons. Uh, Geopark uh, in Brazil. Um, but the networking is also to help the others to keep the principles. So this implies to evaluate periodically the results of the application of the Territorial Development Strategic Plan. This is why every four years, if everything is okay, uh, a pair uh, of evaluators goes to the territory and uh, try uh, and, and will see and report to UNESCO uh, the uh, evolution of this territory and the development of initiatives in accordance, the rules in accordance to the principles of the, the geoparks. This is not to, to, to be a, a, a police corp or, a, or, or something like that. No, 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 no. It's to, it's to help, it's to uh, give uh, ideas, it's to give advice. Uh, even even the recommendations are not a kind of fine. No, the recommendations is to help those that are working that many times are so focused on uh, are is looking to their work like under the microscope and someone that come from outside are able to see many times that their work is much more value than uh, they uh, suspect. Um, of course, the, the territories uh, carried out joint initiatives for the promotion of natural and cultural resources aimed at their, res, uh, uh, their sustainable development. For example, here, the uh, di distinct um, <clears throat> postcards that were produced to celebrate the uh, World Oceans Day uh, that we celebrate uh, in the past 8th of June, um, that all the geoparks in the world, the 177 celebrates this. Of course, those that are in the coastal or insular areas in a particular way, but all the others were obliged to do something related with, or at least were incentivated to do it. <coughs> uh, others, um, Others international days like the Mother Heart Day in, in, in April uh, or um, the, the, the events like the uh, digital event for new uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks um, is something that all the geoparks are invited to celebrate, are invited to uh, add uh, and uh, to contribute. And of course, more recently, uh, with the pandemic, uh, we assumed the, the, the importance of work towards the resilience against uh, the virus and the contamination and the, all the, the problems related. And the geoparks played a very important role. Or more recently, with the war uh, in uh, sorry, the war in Eastern Europe in uh, in. Uh, Ukraine uh, geoparks assumed uh, the, the European geoparks as asylum territories for Ukrainian refugees. So it's this kind of uh, the, the, the strategic altogether that helps geoparks to become more and more strong. And even in the, uh, in the uh, uh, communication or uh, when we assume uh, altogether during the COP26 that UNESCO Global Geoparks contribute in the fight against climate change. This is something that we are working all together and we assumed this uh, as an all. 
No, it's not one, uh, the 177 all together. And we invite, of course, all those that are already aspiring geoparks also to work uh, on this. Um, of course, the intensive courses helps uh, on the, uh, the, 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 the networking and to reinforce all this because this, uh, these capacity building initiatives promote support and the training for leaders and technical teams. And for example, there are something important. Uh, I would like to reinforce this, that uh, the third digital international course on UNESCO Global Geoparks that will be held in Lesbos Island UNESCO Global Geopark in Greece from 15 to 25 of November, uh, those that will apply for UNESCO Global Geopark need to know that it is mandatory to, uh, to be present previously, to, to send uh, people from the team previously to this intensive course. This will be the third digital international course. Uh, so uh, be aware about the data, um, <clears throat> took in our agenda um, this because it's important uh, to participate. Um, I will go further on this. Uh, so networking implies also activities, like because the exchange of activities and experiences among the members of the GGN reinforces, reinforces the value and the recognition of uh, the uh, geoparks. Um, and also the support and training of leaders and technical staff. It is very important that permanently, permanently uh, those that are responsible of geoparks uh, <clears throat> apply to intensive course, develop uh, local courses, um, create conditions for capacity building is absolutely mandatory. Uh, of course, this allows to build relationships and share knowledge between organizations. And many times, many times, this helps to create new ideas, new projects, to find money, uh, to find uh, com community uh, support. This is very, uh, very important. It's the, it's the opportunity for the community uh, engagement, effective community engagement is <clears throat> very important. And of course, uh, the uh, networking also helps to develop other friendly materials that uh, are appropriate to the dissemination and promotion of the territories. Was the case of the uh, application um, Geo tools. If you go uh, now to your phone and uh, search an application with the name Geo tools, uh, you can download and you have the uh, the application for uh, the. <laughs> 10 territories involved in the uh, Atlantic Geoparks project when you can uh, find uh, many, many things uh, about and uh, see, for example, that in the territory you can uh, find prices, 3D objects, augmented reality, etc. Uh, and this is uh, something that resulted from this, uh, this project and the funding that we obtained uh, from European Union. Uh, as a result, we have associations and sustainable collaborative support for the territorial economy. Uh, it's the immediate, the immediate return of the, the work on these networking uh, projects, and uh, they are essential for the man management of any uh, geopark. Uh, of course, the, um, uh, the community activists support the territorial development and uh, uh, one of the uh, deliverables of this project was uh, uh, the emerging of a new paradigm uh, related to the ecosystems health uh, provision. That was something that uh, helped to look at these territories as places that helps the ecosystems health uh, provision. Uh, and of course, uh, at the same time, partners share their commitment towards a collective vision and the common measures. Uh, it's something that put all together focused in uh, the same uh, main goals uh, for the development of their territories. Uh, 
of course, positive messages and good practices shared through the network led to proactive results. So led to examples of good practices. And here you can see that uh, every two years during the uh, GGN conference, uh, the uh, Geopark with the best example of good practices is awarded uh, for their efforts on this. The last one was Adamello Brenta in Italy. Um, those responsible are also obliged to share their commitment with vision and collective actions. And this picture is historical because it's the moment one, when was founded the uh, Latin American and Caribbean uh, Geoparks Network in uh, Achoma in Peru in May of 2017 with a lot of people, not only from uh, these uh, continental areas, but also from e Europe and Asia. Um, of course, that we need to collect all of these, uh, and um, this is why we have in this moment de developing the International Observatory of UNESCO Global Geoparks. Uh, is something that is in this moment being developed in, by, by two UNESCO shares, the UNESCO chair on Geoparks, Sustainable Regional Development and Health Lifestyles, that is under my responsibility, and the UNESCO share on Geoparks and Sustainable Development of Insular and Coastal Areas in the Aegean University, that is under responsibility of Professor Nicholas uh, Zorus. Um, of course, this is an instrument that we are developing for collecting and processing data uh, on the management and operation of the territories designated as UNESCO Global Geoparks, and that we will uh, focus on the activities promoted and developed in uh, um, <clears throat> that are considering the top 10 focus areas defined for UNESCO Global Geoparks. Um, this observatory is intended to serve as a forum for the exchange of experiences and as platform for the collection, analysis, systematization, and dissemination of data resulting from the activities and examples of good practices of the UNESCO uh, Global Geoparks. And this is very important because it's, this is to look at the work that is done in the daily basis, uh, 24, 7, 365, and to uh, translate these in numbers, uh, allowing, allowing to have uh, effective and uh, um, good uh, data to be used to uh, make uh, changes, to improve, to correct, uh, to, de to develop, etc. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, in this moment, we are already uh, working hardly uh, on this. This is the example for the mixed tech alta UNESCO Global Geopark. We have already uh, the, the information. It will be possible to click and obtain uh, information about uh, um, <clears throat> the territory. Um, and naving on the map, it is possible to access the basic information of each uh, UNESCO Global Geopark. And at the same time, to various multimedia content representative of the initiative and uh, good practices, for example, uh, to uh, know uh, about the, uh, the questions related with, for example, the revalidation missions activities, uh, visiting and learning from local communities, uh, the case of the traditional agriculture, the contribution for the SDGs, etc. Um, more examples. Uh, and um, with the work carried on by this observatory, uh, we intend to uh, determine how the, UG, uh, the UNESCO Global Geoparks work every day in achieving territorial management, risk reduction, social inclusion, local sustainability, and capacity building. So to finish, to say you, and this is very important, that the networking is the greatest of the strengths of the Global Geoparks Network allowing UNESCO Global Geoparks to be enhanced as the territorial strategies of sustainable development made with the people and for the people. This is absolutely fundamental because geoparks are made with the people and for the people. So thank you so much for your attention. If you have some question, Please, one question. 
if now anytime you can send me an email and uh, we keep in touch uh, after the course and uh, uh, I can discuss with you. Well, it's time to go uh, further. Uh, and now uh, it's time to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Christine uh, Drangnes. Uh, she is the scientific coordinator of Gea Norvegica UNESCO Global Geopark in Norway, uh, is member of the uh, Global Geoparks Network uh, Executive Board. Um, but, uh, she is the former coordinator of the European uh, Geoparks Network, uh, is member of the uh, Global Geoparks Network Council, um, senior evaluator uh, of the UNESCO Global Geopark, and more recently, uh, she was also uh, nominated by UNESCO advisor of the uh, Baringo Great Rift Valley Aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark in Africa on scope of the UNESCO grant uh, for the development of uh, geoparks in Africa and Arabian countries. So Dr. Christine Rangnes, thank you so much for accepting our invitation uh, to, um, to share with us a, a very important uh, theme. So cleaner shorelines, cleaner oceans, a cleanup project involving society in Gea Norvegica UNESCO Global Geopark. Thank you so much to be here with us. And from now, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear friend and colleague, Artur. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to present this uh, item from our Geopark, which uh, I think is a very good uh, following up of your presentation and also earlier presentations today. I'm also delighted to see so many new names uh, participating in this course because uh, we are so happy to see our families growing. So now I will start this lecture with trying to share my screen. Um, do you see my screen now? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. What is that? Why not? So share the screen and after you show us yeah, the, the PowerPoint. Share my screen. I try to pick this one and share yeah it will okay and now enlarge enlarge it like why is it not enlarging there okay not yet this i remember from the surgery conference also that uh, i can uh, see it now but it's not a full screen i no, think we could the problem is that it is full screen in my... Let me try this one. It's not full screen. Yes, right it's already, it's already. Yes, and, it and it's now. moving? Yes, it's moving. Yes. Good, then I start. So you already <laughs> said my title. Uh, this is in a very important uh, project that we are uh, ongoing project in our geopark. So uh, this is our geopark situated in the east, uh, southeast of, of Norway. Uh, fairly large, 3,000 square kilometers, and you can see from the map that it is a fairly long coastline, uh, about 1,200 kilometer coastline, including all our uh, smaller or bigger islands. A lot of people living here, we have some towns, and we have also several hundred summer houses along the coast. This is also an industrial area in some parts. Uh, among these, we have big, uh, quite big petrochemical factories. We have two big uh, river systems that are draining in here and here, draining into this, uh, this sea uh, and drainage from agricultural area. In this area, we have an important marine uh, national park where we are having a very good cooperation. So all these things uh, made us look into some issues because in our, uh, in our municipalities, we have five municipalities with a coastline. And uh, we are situated, you see the corner of a geopark here, in connected to the Oslo Fjord. 
The Oslo Fjord is an area for recreation. It has been an historical contact line with other countries. We still have trade and ships since the Vikings. They have been using this area. And we have rich fisheries that are very important for the local economy, including the shrimps, lobster, crayfish, a lot of uh, things that we sell, we eat. Uh, it's also for nature life a very important area for migrating birds, seabirds, also see some sea mammals. mammals. But actually, what we have seen in our, uh, in our area is that this good situation that we used to have is not necessarily the situation anymore. So the big question is, okay, is the Oslo Fjord dying? That is what, what some of our researchers are saying. So we, when we look upon some things that are threatening this area, for example, we have uh, a change in, in the algae. The cover, the, the, they cover the ex existing ones with, a, with actually the cradle of, of the um, babies of the fish. We have um, drainage from the agricultural area with the nitrogen and phosphorus. We see less birds, less seabirds. They are dying. This is the either, uh, and if they, they are still present, but they have no, almost no chickens anymore. We know one reason for this is this one here. We have also the invasion from the Pacific oyster. And the Pacific oyster is uh, taking the place of our blue shells, which are the food for the birds. Also, along this coastline, which is one of the most inhabited ones in Norway, we also have, of course, treatment plants for sewage. But we have seen lately that there is a lot of leakage from these kinds of, of, uh, of plants that are also, again, bringing nitrogen and phosphorus into the sea. And from this picture, you can see quite a lot of summer houses. They are densely scattered along our coastline. And we have a lot of fisheries and we can see that the income for the fishermen are lower and lower. And the problem that we see in our geopark is of course, a lot of marine littering. So we were thinking, what can we do as a geopark? Why should we involve? Well, Geoparks, as we have heard uh, over the two days now, it's not only about geological heritage or, or, or uh, uh, interesting thing concerning geology. We are, live, we are sharing one planet and uh, we are involved in all the kinds of, of natural things. <laughs> and also we know that uh, the, this decade, uh, it was really celebrated in Portugal just some weeks ago, the opening uh, or the start of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And as geoparks, of course, we, we work a lot along the lines of the Sustainable Development Goals. And last month was the goal of the month, number 14, Life Below Water. Uh, about conservation uh, of and sustain sustainable use of the ocean, seas and marine resources. So we were thinking, yes, this is actually something we can do something about. So already from 2017, we uh, applied for project money uh, uh, founded by the Norwegian Environmental Agency. We were, our idea was to bring school children out in nature do make, a, make them clean beaches, learning about the nature and the human impact, and most of all, creating awareness. So during this period, we had more than 50 classes, uh, more than also 800 people, and uh, young people out in the beaches. Uh, and we started also a very interesting uh, cooperation with a class that is specializing in research. And they presented our research, this, their results during our last revalidation, and that was very, very interesting. So you can see some examples here of the activities we had over these years. Uh, and the, the research for, from, uh, from the uh, high school, from the research line, uh, this is the, their research area and uh, one of the most uh, outermost islands. Uh, started of picking the visible litter, they started to dig in layers of seaweed where they could see that the waste is degrading, but still present. 
uh, and, the, and the question about microplastic came, of course. They have re registered the, the litter, what type, any signs of origin. And they have started to discuss is sea currents important, visitors, what are they leaving back, uh, ship traffic. And the conclusion is that very much is actually coming from the, with, the, with the sea currents, but also, of course, a lot, lot of local waste, but mainly, but most important conclusion, and this is from the young people themselves, is the enhanced awareness and understanding for consequences and for the need of action. So this year we started a new project, uh, Clean Norway. It's founded by Norwegian Retailers Environment Fund. Uh, so, and that is done in very strong cooperation with what we have as Oslo Fjord Outdoor Council, which have defined areas to clean. And you can see from the map here uh, that uh, it's all along the coast of, uh, of Norway ongoing uh, cleaning operations. And we continued, uh, we are continuing our cooperation with a research line class. So here again, again the map of our geopark in the two red circles uh, are the areas we have cleaned in the longer project. And in our blue line here, it is the uh, ongoing project. So uh, just then a Google Earth uh, picture. Uh, as you can see, we have a lot of islands and this is the area we are going to clean. And here you can see what we have uh, managed to clean more or less ready in the first four and a half months that we have been able to be out. But this is a very uh, good and interesting project for us because we can do a lot of outreach also on this one. But in order to get everywhere, we had to buy a boat. So uh, our geopark have bought the boat that we can uh, have for hire into the project. So actually this is a win-win situation. Uh, we can also bring this boat to, to, um, uh, with, with some school children. Uh, and we have been able to have two new colleagues, here is Christian and Stola, uh, that are working full-time co with coastal cleaning for the geopark. So, and here is also the manager of the Oslo Fjord Outdoor Council uh, visiting us uh, and seeing how we are working. This is the boat, and here you can see the result after one day of cleaning. It is uh, depressing, yes, it is depressing, but on the other hand, we do an effort to, have, to, to, to do better. Uh, we, when we are dealing with this, we can have the possibility to have this store, we can store on the islands if things are too heavy for us to have in one our boat. We store in these big bags, we mark well, and uh, we will have assistance for, from our municipalities that have bigger boats to bring on shore. And we will make sure that if they are deposited in the, in the correct way, and that um, our, the waste is also uh, recycled if possible. So this is a good system and a good example of, uh, of cooperation. We cannot do all these things alone. We also had an interesting, ex uh, because we also have uh, uh, projects, of course, the, Arthur, you explained a lot of our networking. We had a nice visit from Estrela Geopark in Portugal. Uh, this is a project between our two geoparks and Katla Geopark in Iceland. So it, the project was about practical training. Uh, and of course, while our colleagues, our friends was here, they had to participate in the cleaning project. So uh, Estrella people, they were very sportive. Uh, so because it was a quite bumpy boat route right out to the island, it was uh, a lot of litter picking. But as you can see, because that is what we do in our pro program, especially towards school, that we combine practical work and geoscientific discussions. Uh, we, and of course we have nice days out in the, our geopark, but it is very important that we also include knowledge of nature. So these are two pictures that show a little bit before and after. It is uh, a lot to pick. This, these pieces are quite big and easy to, to pick, but that is not always the situation. Because we have, as I mentioned, some uh, factories, some big plants 
This is uh, a producer of uh, plastic ma raw material that they sell for productions all over Europe and all, all over the world. It is big and of course they produce and sometimes uh, bad things happen. Because uh, this is uh, very close to the sea. This, this is how we can find the shore inside this fjord. Uh, you see a lot of uh, grass and things that have been uh, washed uh, to the close shore uh, by, by currents. Maybe, I guess you can see some colored plastic parts here, but if we take a closer look, I've tried to take this small part here and I will show you here. I guess you can see some small, small white uh, pearls. The, this is floating in the sea. It is uh, waste from the plant from the factory. It's spread in the waters. It's very tempting for a fish to think, I don't know if they think, but it looks very much like an egg or something very tasty, so they eat them. And you can imagine it's not good for, for their health, so we find fish with stomachs full of this waste. But how can you pick this? You will take maybe two months to clear this one. So I'm very proud that we are able to do some uh, research. Uh, we tried with a smaller vacuum cleaner that was very, very time consuming and the vacuum cleaners was destroyed after a few hours. So now we do research with a company that are providing a huge uh, vacuum cleaner. Uh, and when uh, you can see all the plastic pearls here, when we use it, we can see that this is what, what we are left with. As you can see, we can remove a lot more, and this is again sieve, and we can separate the plastic. So I think not only for Norway, but for, for the rest of the world, this can be very interesting to learn from because there are some equipments that really must work for, for this process. But this is also sad because birds are finding what they think is nice tools to build their nest. But also we have seen chickens to the bird, bird babies that are uh, strangulated in, in this kind of, of material that are leftovers from fishing industry. And of course, they, the, their mother and fathers cannot separate these blue threads from, from, uh, from the grass and from they should have done, should have used to build their safe home for their kids. So uh, it's really, really important reasons and, and uh, uh, for, for trying our best to, to clean up the mess we have created, because for sure we have created this mess. Uh, so some results so far. It was expected uh, that for the total of our area with the uh, 98 predefined areas, uh, we were, they were expected that we could pick and uh, take away 30 tons of litter. Per July, per this month, we have already collected 20 tons. It's good, but sad in the same moment. From uh, of these 98 predefined areas, we have visited and mainly picked most uh, important things for 75 areas. We need to go back and, and do it again, and uh, we have to recheck. But uh, and most likely after uh, ne or next year, we will deliver a bid for the next call because definitely it's a lot of more areas left to clean. So this will occupy a lot of time, a lot of time for our geopark for the next years to come. This, uh, we, have, um, we have rocks from uh, along our shoreline, uh, uh, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian rocks. And we have remnants of the happy life that lived in our former seas since more than 500 million years. And actually, this is the way we want to keep it. A lot of people enjoying the coastline, swimming in clean waters. Also, we are doing research on our shoreline or we are just enjoying it. This is the way we want to keep it. Uh, but it's, it's not always like that now, as you can see. This is not what we want. This is not what we want to deliver to our next generations. So we think uh, that at least what we can do in smaller parts in uh, along the coast of Norway, it helps not only Norway, but also the general situation 
uh, of the oceans. And um, this is a picture. These things are actually the remnants that we found in uh, along the sea. And uh, our my colleagues Bjorn and Vega made this picture from some of the litter. And of course, it's obvious that we need to act. We need to help the oceans to win the battle. It's on time, it's overdue time. And we know very well that we are to blame. So uh, this was a little bit about our uh, daily life in summer in Geopark. We are working a lot with this issue. We are really concerned and we are really involved. And uh, luckily, we are able to bring also young people out to see the results of our uh, bad behavior as human beings. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy if you have any questions, so I'm happy to answer. So I think I'm pretty on time, uh, Arthur. Well, Kristin, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, and really, really uh, a special uh, approach and a very illustrative uh, about the, the, the consequences that uh, uh, many, many times we are not aware uh, about uh, that uh, small, um, small things like this, the, the last picture that you have with the, the package of the chocolate, uh, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a small one, uh, and, and many times, oh, we are so far from the ocean that uh, uh, till, till achieve the ocean, we'll spend uh, um, enough years until uh, degraded. it. No, uh, and uh, you illustrated this in a, so, with so good examples. So uh, thank you. I will open the floor for some questions. Um, that someone uh, want to, uh, oh yeah, people are, people are congratulating you uh, about if, if someone uh, want to uh, make a question to Dr. Christine Rangnes, please take the floor. Well, uh, Well, no, it seems that <laughs> you you was very uh, accurate in the in the way that you, you explained uh, this. Uh, let's see that uh, it's appear more. Oh, yes, my question. Uh, we have a question. Question from Wang Chao from Lusheng UNESCO Global Geopark in China. My question is, any suggestion for all UNESCO Global Geopark on environment protection? Yeah, I, get, I think it's very good to, to, to focus on the oceans and also remember also that all geoparks, uh, most geoparks, almost every geopark have also rivers that drain into the ocean. So I think uh, to try to include the younger generation and also to work with the authorities in order to have systems because we have seen how plastic just have been exported to other countries and not treated well. So uh, to, to, to really look into the systems on the broad sense to work uh, on very locally with young people uh, and also be aware that we all are connected to the same ocean uh, and, and bear it in mind as geoparks. Uh, is, and to start on a low level, every time we, we try to fix something, it helps a little bit. So that is maybe my advice. And also, since we talked about meeting face-to-face -to, -face, to also bring this item to a discussion next time we see each other. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Christine Rangnes, for your great presentation. It was an honor to us to have you uh, with us sharing this great uh, example and uh, also put your knowledge about uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks in this intensive course. Thank you so much once again. Uh, and uh, now it's time to uh, go to uh, Mr. Miguel Rey Silva. Uh, he is the executive coordinator of the uh, G uh, West Geopark Association. Uh, Association in Portugal he is manager of the system of quality of the Lourinha municipality in Portugal. Uh, 
uh, also coordinator of an uh, interesting project uh, of electric efficiency of the street lighting uh, in the municipality. Uh, in this time that we are talking uh, about uh, um, to, to, to take care with the resources also, but the most important that he is the person in charge uh, of the uh, new uh, aspiring UNESCO Ge Global Geopark in Portugal is the OEST uh, aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. Um, and I must say that he is a lover of UNESCO Global Geopark. So uh, Miguel Rey Silva, thank you so much uh, for accepting uh, our uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us in this uh, intensive course. And uh, Mr. Miguel uh, Rey Silva uh, will share uh, a presentation titled Oceans and Ecosystem Services, the case of the West aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark. Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, uh, for for uh, inv invitation and and to be here. It's always a pleasure to to share our our example or our work because we are not <laughs> example, but uh, a work that we are doing in the last uh, three uh, four years. Um, so uh, today I will speak about oceans ecosystem services, the case of OS Aspiring Geopark. It's, of course, a great challenge uh, for me, considering the presentations made in the, the last three days. So um, I hope I can uh, share something useful. I, uh, I don't know if uh, everyone can see my presentation. Yeah, OK. So before I begin, yes. allow, allow me to introduce the Sparring OS Geopark. It is composed by six municipalities with a total area of 1,154 square kilometers and about 213,000 inhabitants. Uh, being located in the west of Portugal, we have 70 kilometers of coastline embracing the Atlantic Ocean. So we are a land of contrasts where the 70 kilometers of coast offers the services for well-being and sports but also for fishing and science, as I will present in the next slides. Uh, on the other hand, we have a more inland area with uh, limestone mountains, such as Serra de Montjunt, very well known in Portugal, which is 666 meters high. Uh, so uh, it's a, a, a big, uh, a big place for us to 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 share and to to do some activities and to promote the geopark. One of our most important geosites is Ponta do Truval. Uh, it is since 2016 a global strategic section uh, and point, and it's the, our ex libraries. Um, the the global strategic section and point is the best place in the world to study the Tuarcian period, the Jurassic, is our goal, the, uh, the Jurassic, and some 180 million years old, uh, the, the Tuarcian period. So uh, this is our ex libris when you come here, you have to see it. Uh, but the, this GGP, uh, it's not only the geosite international relevance that we have, uh, as we have some other uh, locals where 11 new dinosaurs species have been discovered for science, 11. Uh, the names of these new species are a reference, uh, have the reference to the toponymy of the territory. And it's amazing uh, because every, every day that you visit some places you find uh, something. Um, so I leave here some more numbers of outspots of our aspiring uh, geopark, where I had like the three fossil uh, preparation laboratories in, and the Dino Park, the largest outdoor dinosaur theme park in Europe, where visitors can find more than 180 full scale dinosaurs models. So we have a lot of things to see. Apart, of, apart from the dinosaurs of the Jurassic period, the services 
uh, of our territory are very much focused on the 72 kilometers of coastline. And that's what I'm talking about now. An example of these are the figures that I show you to you on this slide. So we have 72 kilometers of coastline, very beautiful um, places to, to take photos, but uh, uh, they are very, very good conservation to, to, to have some uh, research uh, inside. Besides the white sandy beaches and the Jurassic cliffs, where we find fossils every time we go on a field trip, we have uh, recognized coastal biodiversity such as UNESCO Biosphere Reserve and the Natura 2000 network. <coughs> Sorry. Associated to the biodiversity, we have a research center exclusively dedicated to the sea or to the ocean and either education school dedicated to tourism and sea technologies, which allows allow us to have national and foreign researchers studying the sea its services and potential in the territory. All this work in partnership is articulated with sustainable development goals always. And it's a pleasure to work with all the, our partners. Besides the research, our coast is always a, the stage of very, various national and international sporting events where we highlight the surf bodyboard stages of the World and European Surfing Championship circuit, free ride stages of the World and European uh, Championship Circuit, triathlon in Portugal, where the triathlon born was in Peniche, um, stand-up paddle, and a lot of other uh, sports. This is only possible because the local authorities recognize and invest hundreds of thousands of euros every year to guarantee the quality of the beaches. And this, this is amazing because we are working right now with all the municipalities uh, but the municipal is working in the territory to, to maintain all this for a long year. But the society also benefits from the services provided, provided by the coastal areas. And there is even a very strong sea cluster in our aspiring geopark, as you can see. Other services already available related to the sea or to the ocean where we highlight the interpretation center, but also one of the largest fishing and recreational ports in Portugal, Peniche. That's the, the center. I also outlined the technological park dedicated to the sea a natural reserve and one of the oldest scanning uh, industries in the country. So in relation to the territory geosites, we identify, identified 80 uh, geosites divided into six categories, most of which we can uh, found along our 70 kilometers of coastline. And with that, we already uh, did some work, uh, planning work. Uh, we have a careful analysis where we evaluate, among others, its values, accessibility, and infrastructure. Associated to the diagnosis, we are working together with the public and private entities in the monitoring and definition of monitoring strategies. In some way, we have notice of services that each geosite and its ecosystem can promote. That's very important to have the whole big picture about our geosites and how to work in each geosite. So the sea provides services that allow us to promote the territory as a surf well-being cluster and that's imp very important for geotourism because we already have the structure, the, the, the hotels and the places to, to visit. So we have to combine uh, everything uh, and we have all the conditions to do that. <clears throat> Provides the ideal conditions for development for actions related to knowledge and science. And that we have uh, more than 100 uh, educational programs that help us with, uh, with a, a very big network, uh, with partnerships, uh, specializing educational programs, uh, and we have all that working right now. So we have all the conditions to, to, to be part uh, of a, a network that uh, uses the the ocean and the sea to promote the education and the science and the tourism. 
So when we see when we talk about your conservation, uh, we can say that it provides the conditions necessary for us to be one of the largest fossil fuel preparation centers in Europe today. <coughs> Sorry. So the future of our territory is directly linked to the climate change and the oceans. Therefore, the debate, the main discussion forums, but also with local, national, international partners is essential to develop the best partnership to fight globally against local problems. And I think this is one of the, the sentences that I can deliver today. In this sense, public and private partnerships are effectively essential for a geologically based on sustainable development strategy. And this is how we are working in the last two years. And I ended with the I end with three words that sum up my presentation, but also the Sparring Geo Park. Territory, heritage, and communities. That's for for them that we are working and to get a, a better better territory, but also a better place for tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation, uh, giving us uh, a view of uh, an aspiring geopark that is really uh, focused on the ocean. Uh, and um, I think that uh, for many of those that uh, are uh, here uh, could be uh, also uh, example of good practices in some aspects. So I will open the floor for a question to Mr. Miguel Rey Silva. Let me see. <coughs> People are congratulating you, but no, no questions. <laughs> Um, so, Miguel, what are in this moment the main challenge for this aspiring UNESCO Global Geopark uh, towards the, the the relation uh, with with the ocean? Is the uh, is the mass tourism, uh, or uh, or this is not the uh, a problem? Not not yet. Uh, I think we are uh, we have a very uh, we don't have that problem yet, but we have problems that are uh, shared with almost uh, the, the geoparks and the fine geoparks that uh, presented their territory here. For example, the last one uh, with um, the pollution and the, the microplastics, we have uh, education problem, problems, uh, programs with uh, some partners uh, uh, that we develop with schools, because that's a, a, a big, Big problem. We have 72 kilometers of uh, of coast of coastline, and uh, we receive uh, a lot of tons of uh, plastic and other garbage in our uh, in our beaches. So it's it's always complicated to 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 want to to promote the coastline, to promote uh, the views, and we have plastic and other garbage always there. Um, so we don't have specific problems. Uh, we share problems like the others. Uh, that's why it's so important for us, the networking and the, the observatory, uh, because the same problems can have uh, uh, probably the same uh, solutions. Uh, so we are, we are open to share our, our examples or our experience and and to to gather more more information about the other the other geosites because we believe that that's the the path to the future. We have here a question from Tarek Ben Fraj from Tunisia. Uh, he said, "Would you please give us a short idea about the geoconservation actions?" Okay, and I will share some information in the chat about that. Um, yes. Uh, about the or because we have uh, 72 kilometers of coastline, uh, that's a big challenge for us because almost all the fossils, dinosaur fossils, are in the coastline, uh, and the climate change 
uh, it's it's always playing with us uh, or the ocean is always playing with us uh, because to every day destroy some part of the 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 coast projection the natural coast projections um so in major times we have to to have teams not as uh, aspiring geopark but our partners we have three partners in the territory uh, that uh, uh, where belongs the the three laboratories and they study and prepare all the fossils so uh, every summer uh, they they go to the camp and to the coastline to 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 get more fossils and to try to protect some locals the majority of the times they have to to take the, the fossils from the coastline and to prepare them and and later to put it in the museums to 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 get it visit and studied so um, that's the the biggest uh, challenge but the, it's also the biggest action that we have for the the, the dinosaur fossils and the nests because I know that we have that said that we have four four five nests uh, dinosaur nests here so it's it's always a big challenge for us but the, to take the fossils from the the the, the place it's our biggest uh, action. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Miguel, uh, once for again, time. for uh, your uh, presentation and for accepting uh, our invitation. It was an honor to us to have you uh, with us, uh, sharing uh, your, uh, your experiences and uh, uh, for sure that those that uh, assisted take some uh, interesting ideas. Thank and you very now, much. Uh, going further, uh, it's time to uh, introduce you, uh, Dr. Daniela Rocha. Uh, she is a geologist, is uh, the manager of the Aroca UNESCO Global Geopark in Portugal. Uh, during many time, uh, she was responsible uh, for the educational programs and also uh, for the, uh, the development in the field from some uh, uh, scientific programs. Um, she has a great experience uh, in networking uh, projects and activities. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, we invited her is uh, because she idealized the geosite route in the Roque UNESCO Global Geoparks that is already a uh, really uh, geotouristic uh, success. So, uh, Dr. Daniela, thank you so much. Uh, for your presence. Uh, thank you for accepting uh, our uh, invitation. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. And uh, from now, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, Professor Artur Saad. Thank you for yeah. the invitation. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon to share uh, a project that we have implemented in the Roca UNESCO Global Geopark since 2015. Uh, we are not a coastline geopark, but really in our rocks, uh, we preserve uh, ancient uh, and oldest uh, uh, oceans that uh, already exist on uh, our Earth planet. And uh, in my presentation, I will try to explain a little bit uh, this, this project. So for those that uh, doesn't know where is Aroca UNESCO Global Geopark, it is a, a territory with a more or less 328 square kilometers located in the north of Portugal, which borders uh, correspond to the administrative borders of one municipality of Portugal, with the municipality of Aroca. Uh, and um, here we have uh, uh, more or less 22,000 inhabitants in our territory. And we, our, and this territory belongs to the metropolitan, metropolitan area of Porto and the tourism region of Porto and north of Portugal. Our Ipsum tree map reveals that our territory is a, a, mountainous, a mountainous one, and uh, the dominant altitudes range from 200 to, from, uh, until 600 meters, 
and the highest point uh, is in Montemur Mountain with 1,222 meters high. In this territory, we inventoried in 2008 41 geosites. They are disseminated for all, all uh, the territory, but our project uh, have 31 of them, which are really visitable. The project that I will talk about, the root of the geosites. Concerning uh, our uh, geodiversity of our territory, uh, she is dominated by rocks from the Dorubeiro Super Group. Uh, this is the, the green ones that we can see in this map. Uh, these rocks have more or less 600 million years, are the oldest one in our territory, uh, and they are uh, namely schists, graveyards, quartzites, and conglomerates. At the northeastern area of the Ruka Geopark, there, there are a range of metasedimentary rocks with, with age from 475 and 300 million years. Uh, this, these rocks are very important and special for us. And the lithologies are from Ordovician, Silurian, and Carboniferous periods, corresponding basically to quartzites, slate sand carbonaceous schists with fossils and conglomerates. These rocks present many of the fossils that brought fame of our region, particularly the giant trilobites and the ichnofossils, whose characteristics present led the experts to give them an international importance and relevance. During the Superior Paleozoic, there are a collision between the existing continents, leading the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea and the process of um, a mountain formation known as Variscan orogeny led to the formation of the pre existing rocks, uh, the formation of faults, of uh, faults, and uh, also the installation of the, our uh, magmatic rocks. Uh, and uh, we have six one uh, spread in this map, like the Alvarenga, Aroca, Regolf, Montemuro, Freita, and uh, Castanheira. Concerning our, our project in specific, the root of the geosites, uh, this is considered by us the best way for to tell uh, geodiversity stories in the Rokunis Global Geopark, in our geotourism destination. Um, based on the qualification and appreciation of the geological heritage of our region and the enhancement of the tourist and educational activity in the territory, this is a new way for to get to know the Aroca Geopark, combining the knowledge and the unique, remarkable, and unforgettable experience in an excellent geotourism destination. The structuring of this route resulted from a long and meticulous work, which allowed to include 31 of the 30 of the 31 geosites uh, previously inventoried and characterized in this territory in three itineraries to be done by car with some sections on foot. The proposition of these itineraries was based on five criteria, the geographical proximity of the geosites, the touristic interest of the itinerary, the accessibility and the vulnerability of the geosites and the diversity of interests of the geosites. Therefore, the outcome was an interesting proposal consisting in three itineraries that seek to briefly define the three ge main geographical areas of our territory. So we have uh, three itineraries. In the southern area, we have the Freita. Uh, also, we have in green the, the um, itinerary of the mines of the territory. In the northern northeast area of the geopark, where we have the blue one, the itinerary of Pyvan. The route uh, of the geosites of the Ruka Geopark is duly signposted through this classified territory in accordance with the, the transit regulations provided by the highway code. Therefore, the visitor to these itineraries should follow the entrance of directional signs of these routes. So we have in our territory route 
entrance, and entrance signs, we have root direction signs, we have pedestrian or road indication signs, and also all the geosites of the route have an identification of a, a red flag. And in this one, the visitor will find a QR code that can be read through the, this iPhone or tablet to access more information about the geosite directly from the Geopark uh, website. Also, we have a book uh, in paper, a guide that could accompany the, the visitors that can make this uh, route autonomously. In this presentation, I will focus in the itinerary C because I just have 20 minutes to be here with you. Uh, I will talk a little bit more about the Paiva itinerary, which links uh, 12 geosites in the northern area of the geopark, offering the nature and the wild of the Paiva Valley, as well as the mysteries of the rocks of the Paleozoic era. And in this itinerary, we start for uh, uh, them for a very important, maybe our in, most important geosite of our geopark, which is inside uh, of this museum, the Museum of Giant Trilobites, which have a big collection of trilobites and other fossils that provides from a fossiliferous site, very important in, and very popular here in our territory, as the Valerius quarry, uh, because here slates have been extracted since the mid of the 20th century, was proposed in their transformation and their use in civil construction. Therefore, these slates have uncovered an important fauna of invertebrate fossils consisting of trilobites, bivalves, vostrocons, gastropods, cephalopods, brachiopods, echinoderms, Yolitides, Cornularis, Ostracodes, Graptolites, and Ichnofossils. Initially, uh, these fossils are considered as flute time animals. Today, we know that these were living beings of the margin of and uh, the Gondwan of the Gondwan Apollo continent, nearby 465 million years ago. The paleontological register of trilobites found in this quarry is a very important, not only because of the gigantism <laughs> achieved by many species, but also because of its high level of conservation. In this sense, the environmental conditions of the, the time favored the conservation of the carapaces, carapaces next to complete corpses of some species of trilobites, so that many of these fossils completed the knowledge of some of these fossils. The greatest contribution of these geosites to the biology of trilobites was the discovery of mono and multi-specific association of these fossils. The concentration of groups of individuals in a similar antogenic slate, like this picture present, is interpreted here has an indication of gregarious behavior achieved by many trilobites during the mass molting or the mo or the reproduction in the ocean, uh, in the oldest ocean that already exists on our uh, Earth planet. After the visit of the our geosite and following our route of the geosites we can uh, walk a little bit, more or less 700 meters uh, through a forest road, and we arrived to the Ocean, Ordovician Ocean geosite. This is characterized by the presence of some evidence of a glaciation occurred in the end of the Ordovician period. One of the most intensive glaciations on record, on record responsible for the extinction of 80% of the marine species that live in the ocean at that time, at more or less 445 million years ago. This glaciation had its peak in the northeast Africa, where the South Pole was then located, and it was responsible for the significant lowering of the sea level having contributed to the deposit gap about more or less 
15 million years old, verified in the rocks that are crafted in this region. Therefore, in the post-glacial period, sands were deposited in the Paleo-Antarctic latitudes, originating quartzite massifs of the subred formation bases that locally forms a residual relief called Galinheiros. These quartzite levels were later covered by silt and clay that originated the sandy schists there where the drop stones were inserted in the medium and the superior part of subred formation. Here it is possible to find clasts that we can see here in this picture um, inserted in the schist sandy matrix that testify the occurrence of the clusters rain resulted from the fusion of the icebergs that were drifting in the rake ocean already existed on, on our planet Earth. Continue the, following our uh, route of the geosites, we can walk more 115 meters by foot, and we arrive to the Silurian outcrop. Uh, in this period of the Silurian, uh, that was an increasing dipping of the sea level in the Gondwana Paleo continent that helped the deposit of a fine sediments and low oxygen conditions originating black schists where there are some colonial planktonic fossils preserved called graptolites. The geosite reflects in an outcrop of a very fissile phthenite where it is possible to find and observe a graptolite fauna from Tlaciano with about uh, 439 million years. Following, following a little bit more, our route, uh, more or less 400 meters by foot, we arrived to the Carboniferous conglomerate, another geosite. It is a clustered supported conglomerate formed by elements coming from older neighbor rocks, like schists and grow wakes, of the Dorubeira supergroup rocks, and also from quartzites that have uh, belongs to the Santa Justa and Subrid formations. The origin of this conglomerate is from the superior Paleozoic when there was a collision between earth existing continents, leading to the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea and to the process of the mountain formation of the Variscan orogeny. This folding and uh, is, you create uh, the Bashan chain would have limited the formation of a lacustrine intermountain basin, which are fulfilled by sediments coming from the erosion and the breakdown of their slopes, creating a Doru Carboniferous Basin at the end of the Carboniferous era about 300 million years ago. After the Carboniferous conglomerate and following the route, of the geosites, we can walk a little bit more, more or less 660 meters. And we found another flag uh, um, of uh, the geosite. And in this case, the Grelheira d'Agua site. This is a ridge that corresponds to a residual relief of quartzite dating back to the Erdenigian inferior order vision with more or less 475 million years. This quartzite results from the deposition in shallow waters of fine sands, and it preserves several marks of the activity of living beings, ichnofossils, such as Cruziana traces, resulting from the activity of the arthropods. Also here, we can find the presence of a Roman fojo, a Roman mine of gold uh, that already was explode, exploded in the times of the Romans. After this site, we can catch our car and uh, nine kilometers after, we are already in another geosite, which is the G37, and uh, which name is Ichnofossils from Cabanas Longas. Here we have uh, an infrastructure that the geopark made, a new one is uh, uh, the Ichnofossils observation platform. We have some steps. To, to go to there, uh, exactly 205 uh, stairs. 
Um, and in this area, we, we, we have sub-verticality quartzite outcrops located to Cabanas Longas, which is the, the village um, very close to this place. And in these surfaces, almost as vertical, are the inferior face of the quartzite data where strata where it is possible to observe a significant preserved amount of traces from Cruziana, resulting from the activity of arthropods which lived in the shallow sea at about 475 million years ago. Regarding this, from the Ichnofossils observation platform, we can see a wide quartz that surface full of bilobulate furrows, which are inversely lift molds of the original shiseldal trace probably made by trilobites. In this particular geosite, two generations of traces can be observed, marked mainly by tracks of Cruziana forcifera and Cruziana rugosa that intersect in an angle of 110 degrees and other specific uh, and scientific uh, features uh, that made of this place an international uh, geosite um, uh, following the, our researchers like the professor Artur San. After this geosite, we can catch the car and one kilometer before, we have a geosite with a geomorphological interest with each the Mirapaiba site, which have a, a very beautiful landscape for this very important river of our territory, which is Paiva River, very well known from the adventure sports that here are practiced, uh, like the rafting. And after that, more five kilometers before, we go to another infrastructure that we also inaugurated in 2015, and which is Paiva Walkways. It's, it is very well known because it won and won very a lot of awards, like the World Travel Awards, uh, the, the Oscar of Tourism uh, awards, awards. And uh, these uh, uh, infrastructure are also important because uh, it, uh, it links people with nature and links also five uh, geosites that tells a lot of histories of our, of our um, uh, planet Earth. These geosites are the Paiva Gorge, the Guerreiro's Waterfall, Val, Gola do Salto, and Spiunca Falls. In this, in this area, we can uh, contact with the rocks, the, the oldest one, the oldest ones of our territory with the rocks of the Super Douro Beira group, uh, in particular schists, uh, quartzites, and conglomerates, and also one granite body, which is the Alvarengan. And uh, for to know more about this route, uh, we, I invite you to go to the, the website of the Geopark, which is www dot arucageopark.pt. Here you, you have all the information of our geodiversity and our uh, geosite route. We try to dynamize this route with uh, an annual program of interpreted visits. It is a, a very successful activity of our geopark and our main interest is to, to um, Keep people from the to to of from geology to engage people with the geology of uh, our geopark and our planet Earth. And uh, I finished my presentation, and I'm ready to to answer all your uh, questions. I think uh, 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 the time was. Uh, uh, 20 minutes. <laughs> <Don't forget. laughs> it was perfect, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that uh, it was a, a, a very good explanation of the <clears throat> of this um, st strategy used <clears throat> to the development of the territory uh, and uh, to to share also something that uh, was uh, that became 
uh, a success, uh, touristic success, uh, as you, as you uh, referred um, together, uh, Aroca up to now already received 13 uh, <coughs> uh, world travel awards. Yes. Uh, what is something unique uh, in the in the entire uh, UNESCO Global Geoparks? Uh, it's something in fact um, very very interesting. So uh, I will open the floor uh, to some of you uh, if you want to. Uh, ask uh, Dr. Daniela Rocha. Uh, we have already uh, one, one question that appeared very early here from uh, uh, Wang Tao from uh, Lushan UNESCO Global Geopark in China. Uh, he said, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, dear uh, Professor Daniela Rocha. My question is, any challenge of the geo heritage conservation in your geopark? Yes. Uh, we are always uh, with challenges because all the sanalization, all the infrastructures that we have, we made uh, every week's uh, monitorization of this because uh, we need to have everything very well done, very well signalized, very well exp um, for the people that visit us because we want that people like our territory. We want that people like our geology. We, we want that people like uh, our rocks that preserve the oceans of uh, the ancient oceans of uh, our uh, planet Earth. And, and it is one work that we can, we think we need to do uh, always, always, never, never uh, stop it. But also, we we would like uh, in the next years also to to work in the way of to make all these sites accessible for people uh, that have some diseases, uh, and we are uh, working in a project uh, for the future for to put the geosites accessible for all the people, all the all, all for all. Okay, thank you. It's our main challenge in the next years, I think, in concerning this, this route and uh, the geology and the geodiversity of our territory. Okay, we have here uh, another another question. Um, probably uh, I, I will make the, the question and after uh, I can say something uh, about also. Uh, this is a question from Mr. Cardali uh, from Morocco. Uh, he said, uh, we have one of the best local fossil sites, Fezuata. How we can integrate in our project? Uh, uh, Professor Artur, you can, you can uh, <laughs> answer. I don't know this geo site. Yes, uh, the Fezuata site in Morocco, uh, it's one of the, for sure, one of the most important geo sites in the world. One of the most important paleontological sites uh, in the world. It's, um, it will appear for sure in, in the first 100 uh, geo sites. It's something that is a big challenge because you need to uh, protect entirely this geo site in order to avoid uh, the misuse uh, and the commerce of fossils from uh, Fezuata. Uh, is uh, you have a big challenge in front of you. You will need the to de develop many initiatives, uh, not only uh, about the awareness of the the policy, the policies, the police, uh, and other uh, authorities, but also uh, in order to uh, preserve uh, this uh, this area. It's a very hard, but at the same time, very interesting uh, challenge that for sure those that are uh, working in this project in Morocco will face, uh, will face in, in the first steps, in the first steps of the project. Well, uh, Daniela, you have a lot 
of people congratulating you, uh, you for your presentation for sure and they even even Soraya thanking you for the cooperation of the Aroca UNESCO Global Geopark in the survey for uh, our research. So another example of networking. Yes. Um, Soraya is here with us? Yes, Soraya. Okay. <laughs> so with us. In this yes, moment, she's working with us in... In this moment, research. we have 69 persons uh, in, uh, in the chat. Um, so, Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Once more, it uh, was very nice to have, have you uh, with her. It was an honor to have you with us. Uh, and now it's time to go further. And uh, uh, I will introduce Dr. Silvia Pepoloni. Uh, she is a researcher at the National Institute of Geophysics and uh, Volcanology in Rome, in Italy. Uh, she is a, a secretary general and a founder member of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics, and she is also director of the School on Geoethics and the Natural Issues. Well, uh, in our opinion, uh, it will be a very important to have now a vision uh, of uh, uh, on many of the questions uh, that were presented during this intensive course uh, and uh, was discussing here during these days. So due to that, uh, we invited uh, Dr. Silvia Pepuloni to talk uh, us about the geoethics and oceans, challenges and opportunities. Dear Dr. Silvia Pepuloni, thank you so much for uh, having us accepting uh, our invitation is a real honor to us to have you uh, in this uh, event. Uh, and uh, for sure, for all of those that are attending now, it will be a great opportunity to listen to you talking uh, about uh, this scene. So from now, uh, dear Dr. Silvia Pepoloni, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very glad to be here and to share with you some thoughts about uh, oceans from the perspective of geoethics. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Just a few minutes to share my, my uh, screen. Yes, okay? perfect. 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 So, my presentation will touch the following points. Uh, what oceans represent for human life, which is our perception of and the interaction with the oceans, the role of oceans in the Earth system. Hydrosphere is one of the subsystems through which we can analyze the global system of relationships that constitute the planet. The main changes affecting oceans, the multiple effects that the anthropogenic global warming produces on physical, chemical, and biological features of oceans, and those changing changes affect also societal aspects, modifying the processes that characterize social ecological systems. What is the geoethics and why it can help to redefine human ocean interaction. Geoethics is an ethics of responsibility towards the earth system. Its principles and values provide the reference frameworks for our ethical choices and for taking decisions about current and future issues regarding our life on the planet. And finally, I will focus on the deep sea ocean mining that, in my opinion, represents one of the greatest challenges affecting our interaction with the oceanic environment. And it is important to evaluate its possible consequences in an ethical and social perspective. Well, oceans are the frame, the scenery, the background of human life. In the human imaginary, they are a symbol of life, movement, infinity, a symbol of transience and mutability. Oceans are dynamic place, glow as eustatisms, impetus as waves, regular as tides, fast and unpredictable as tsunamis, a dynamic place through which human beings challenge nature, 
ally with nature and are defeated by nature. Human communities get food and energy from oceans, develop their commercial activities and economy, wage wars, build and undo relationships. Through the oceans, human beings seek aesthetic pleasure, physical and intellectual enjoyment, contact with wild nature. Oceans build the identity of coastal and population of inlands, giving sense to their activities, to their life as navigator, explorers, fishermen. Oceans have always been a dream and a limit for human beings. Hope for new life for migrants, hope for hegemony for the great economic powers. But humans are terrestrial and oceans can represent a limit for human life. Even though but life on Earth originate from water, and when we seek life in the universe, first of all, we look for water, establishing a continuum between our being and the universal being. So the future of humanity is closely linked to oceans. Oceans make up the blue continent, the largest on the planet, occupying more than 70% of the Earth's surface. On their bottom, new crusts continuously generate from ridges and hotspots, and old crust is consumed in the trenches. Fields of black smokers convey the heat from the Earth's interior to the depths of the sea. And those hydrothermal vents are fisheries on the seafloor close to rich and hot spot, from which geothermally heated water discharges, rich of chemical elements and minerals that nourish biological complex communities of giant tube worms, clams, limpets, and streams, included bacteria at the base of the food chain. But we don't know much about that cold and dark water continent. Oceans remain mostly unknown, and we especially ignore how much vulnerable are marine ecosystems to anthropic actions. There is a wide range of phenomena directly or indirectly produced by human activities generated in the oceans or on the mainland, but having effects in the ocean. Some of them are effects of the anthropogenic global warming. Others are more directly related to the engineering attitude of Homo sapiens, who modifies the natural environment for shaping its vital niche. Modifications intervene at physical, chemical, biological, and geological level. And changes produce other changes by following positive feedback mechanisms that generate new changes and that in turn reinforce the initial one. Oceans support a wide variety of habitats that are interconnected with the climate system of the planet through the exchange of water, energy, and chemical elements such as carbon. Ultimately, anthropogenic climate changes affect marine environments and ecosystem by triggering the self-reinforcing loops leading toward new stages of transient equilibrium. In this slide, a list of worrying phenomena for the human being. Sea level rise, it produces many important effects such as the modification of the hydrodynamic and coastal depositional regime the intrusion of the saline wage, the increased risk of sea flooding, the loss of coastal wetlands, the reduction of animal and plant biodiversity, and of CO2 absorption capacity. These effects will lead to the abandonment of the coasts in several areas of the planet. Sea temperature rise, oceans absorbs over 90% of the excess heat in the climate system. A warmer ocean 
releases part of its dissolved oxygen with consequences on marine ecosystems. And the increasing temperature can also lead to a growing number of hurricanes and tropical storms and can produce the breakdown of clathrate molecules with release of methane with a strong positive feedback on global warming and on also on the, the possibility to uh, in, to have um, landslides, submarine landslides, and so tsunamis. Acidification, oceans absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, and if its atmospheric concentration increases, oceans absorb more CO2. The pH of water decreases and consequently increases its corrosive capacity on the shells of living organisms. And this implies the reduction, the loss of biodiversity, the alteration of marine life and food chain. But also human overfishing contributes to the destruction of marine life. This is a global problem that is having great social and economic repercussions on human communities in developing countries whose life is based on fishing. Ocean circulation change, at large scale, it has direct effects on the climate of large areas of the planet, as in the case of the Gulf Stream that mitigates the climate at the high latitudes of Europe. At local level, it affects the delicate coastal dynamics that determine the modification of the interface between land and sea with consequences of human settlements, infrastructures, and ecosystems. And finally, ocean pollution agricultural fertilizers and other contaminants produced by anthropogenic activities reach the oceans through rivers. And this increases water eutrophication and modifies its chemical elements content. Plastics and microplastics present in water and ocean floors are considered components of new anthropogenic rocks called plastic glomerate. While all these phenomena determine an increasing risk to human life, actions to be taken have three objectives with multiple effects. The mitigation of effects through engineering works, such as shoreline protection systems, barrier, septa, dams, pumps for backflow prevention, beach nourishment or ecosystem-based interventions, such as a mangrove forest in the intertidal zones of tropical areas. The restoration of ecosystems, for example, through responsible fishing or waste and pollutants reduction or coral restoration, it is a long-term process, considering that some marine ecosystem take decades to fully recover and deliver potential ecosystem services. And adaptation that includes population and infrastructure transfer, floating settlements, land use change, monitoring networks implementation, warning system, blue economy. It is evident that this action should aim at removing the causes that produced those effects. Well, we have to consider that even if today we eliminated the causes of global warming man induced, its effects would continue to act over time since the Earth system has its inertia to change. And today, these anthropogenic changes are so fast that we are running the risk of not being able to adapt to new conditions just as quickly. The current global ecological crisis highlights the crisis of the human being and the failure of the 500 years old logics used to manage the world. Humanity is close to a critical tipping point. The IPCC's reports are clear. Science has no doubts on this point. Human development as creating well-being in a part of the world, but in the remaining part, even greater inequalities have increased 
and the environment has suffered the unsustainable pressure. It is evident that this way to manage our vital niche doesn't work. States are trying to develop a global strategy for reducing human impacts on environment and creating conditions for a better human living. In 2015, the United Nations adopted the 70 Sustainable Development Goals to be reached by 2030. Unfortunately, these goals will be not achieved in the due time, but it is important to start developing a common process by subscribing a deal focused on sharing common principles that are the defense of environment and the recognition of dignity and rights of people. A great signal, even if this is not enough to shift the world towards new sustainable trajectories. But what do we need to make our decision-making process more effective? Firstly, it is necessary and urgent to rethink human relationships and build a new vision of our being into nature. We need to reconsider our societies, their joints, their productive legislative and political structures, the educational programs, our lifestyles. We need an idea of future based on a, on a renewed ethical framework of reference to guide human choices, to be grounded on geoscience knowledge, which helps us to understand the functioning of Earth system. We need a relational ethics, an ethics of responsibility. That is to say, we must make our choices considering consequences of our actions on the system of interactions in which we are immersed and considering time intervals that are wider than our single life. A global ethics for a globalized world, geoethics respond exactly to this need in this historical moment. Geoethics is capable of orienting human beings towards new development trajectories illuminated by awareness, responsibility, and based on science. Geoethics initially developed in the context of geosciences as a process of consciousness rising of the social role those disciplines can and should play in support of society in facing global anthropogenic change. Over the years, the theoretical framework of geoethics progressively developed, articulated and reached to the point that from a primarily professional geoscience ethics, it has expanded to include extra professional responsibilities towards society and the environment until it becomes definable as an ethics of the human agent towards the earth system. This is the definition of geoethics. It clearly underlines the need to preliminarily identify the common values on which to base the choices that define the relationship between the human being and the earth, placing geosciences at the center of the issues as indispensable disciplines to understand the importance that this relationship is shaped responsibly and sustainably. Geoethics considers the relationship between human beings and the Earth system as a specific object of an analysis capable of defining the best ways of implementing this relationship in the light of shared principles and values that overcome the differences of the various social, ecological, and cultural contexts. Problems that have global impacts on societies need for shared solution by Earth human inhabitants. On the one hand, we need to cultivate diversity to catch all the speculative and pragmatic opportunities offered by human intelligence. On the other hand, we need to share analysis, methods, and practices to reach common goals such as living on the planet in a more responsible and sustainable ways. 
a solid geoscientific basis and a philosophical reference framework to be proposed in very different human contexts are indispensable to face the current ecological crisis. Sharing them implies to establish a dialogue, to create a common language. And in fact, the complexity of the world and problems affecting the planet require multidisciplinary approaches and transdisciplinary cooperation. Well, geoethics deals with all these issues. It works to favor this process. The conceptual structure of bioethics is rooted in three main principles, dignity, freedom, and responsibility. Dignity is the recognition of the existential rights and values to anyone or to anything. Dignity presupposes the intention to respect oneself and others. Geoethical action is functional to recognize the right to existence for any entity and its value. Freedom. Freedom is the existential condition of the human agent, thanks to which the individual is able to think, process, and choose through options without external constraints that limit their intellectual and operational faculties. Responsibility is the ethical criterion for the human agency to ensure recognition and protection of the intrinsic value of any living and non-living element with which the human being relates on the planet. The principle of responsibility expresses the commitment to answer for our action and their consequences. So making responsible choices requires applying ethical principles in the search for a superior good, not only for the benefit of today's societies, but also considering the impact of those choices on future generations. Well, an effective example to discuss the human-ocean interaction from a geoethical perspective is the deep sea ocean mining. It is one of the great challenge of our near future when a huge increase of minerals and metals will be needed. Unfortunately, the current economic paradigms are a long way from circularity. Our digital and green economy is energy and mineral consuming. We need a growing quantity of rare earths to build our technological devices. And the world population growth will increase the demand even more. In this scenario, deep sea mining is emerging as a possible solution. But are we sufficiently aware of what this activity would imply? In the case of deep sea mining, there is a crucial dilemma. On the one hand, sustaining the transition to a more sustainable, low carbon economy requires significant additional quantities of minerals and metals, which only the mining industry can provide. On the other hand, the oceans are almost unknown areas of the planet with very delicate ecological balances. Oh, okay. With very delicate ecological balances and the biodiversity that is extremely vulnerable to small environmental changes. Let's wonder what would happen if large remotely guided rovers and robots started to collect the enormous quantities of raw materials existing on the seabed. The levels of uncertainty surrounding our knowledge of oceanic systems are still too great for us to be able to make definitive decisions. Despite the International Seabed Authority has approved 30 exploration contracts in the international waters aimed at investigating possible limitations and impracticality, impracticality of submarine mining activities. However, the frontier of deep sea mining in international waters is approaching, still without being able to assess in quantitative terms the actual ecological risks 
but only having a qualitative idea of the pros and cons of such activities, and especially without having internationally agreed upon the limits of environmental acceptability. From an ethical perspective, the following issues are at stake. Firstly, the respect for those still unknown marine ecosystems put at risk by such an invasive activity. Sorry. Secondly, the right of everyone to be informed about the issue, especially local communities, to be put in the condition to understand the consequences of this activity, to be involved into discussion and final decisions about the practicability of deep sea mining. Population must be free to consciously decide on these delicate issues through an adequate information on the related scientific, technological, economic, legal, and social implications. This is the base to create a knowledgeable society. Third, the responsibility of scientists to evaluate pros and cons and to correctly inform decision makers, as well as the responsibility of politics to decide being aware of consequences of this type of mining from multiple perspectives and, be, and being free from conflicts of interest. To conclude, oceans are a great opportunity for the future, but at what price? We still need to understand it well. First of all, we should act by trying to change our inland economic models before going into oceans. Otherwise, we are simply shift, shifting our problems from the land to the oceans. The human impact on marine ecosystem have to be adequately evaluated from a scientific point of view to understand if it is possible to reduce them below an acceptable limit for the natural environment and human communities involved. And in any case, the decision about deep sea mining should be the result of shared responsible choices and not as is often the case, the result of the risky enterprises of a few industrial lobbies. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry if uh, I use much time than uh, what- Don't, is don't worry, Silvia. For you. <laughs> thank you so much for your uh, presentation that uh, in fact was really, really uh, very important uh, because was a kind of, uh, corollary of many of the things that we discussed here Hello. during this, uh, this three-day journey uh, with a lot of different uh, examples. Many uh, approaches are perfectly in line with uh, your presentation and take this into account. Um, I will open the floor to those that want to uh, ask you some questions, please. Don't be shy, <laughs> Dr. Silvia Pepoloni, for sure, <laughs> she, she is. Uh... No, of course, for all the, I, I understand that geoethics is not a common uh, subject for many of, of you. And um, of course, there are a lot of material to, to go in depth in this uh, subject on the website of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics. So uh, I can uh, write the, the, in the chat the website. Eccolo, here in the chat. Yes, uh, Dr. Silvia already shared uh, in the chat, uh, uh, or was Professor Giuseppe Di Capua uh, the the link for the also is the same <laughs> the, yes. the link for the the, the web, web page of the Geoethics uh, Association. Uh, but we have a question from Elizabeth Silva. How can geoethics really help us in a daily basis work? 
uh, that we have to do in the geoparks. Yes, um, Elizabeth, nice to see you. Uh, ge geoparks are uh, extremely important for geoethics because uh, geoparks is uh, the, the concrete expressions of what geoethics uh, uh, promote, what the values, the principles of geoethics. So um, I think that uh, geoparks uh, can become uh, the 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 perfect places where to uh, promote geoethical principles, where to uh, spread uh, a new, a new uh, relationship with nature, with environment, in all uh, its components, not only scientific, technical, or in, um, something related to enjoyment, but also uh, aesthetic. Uh, we are part of nature, so geoparks uh, is fundamental. Uh, and um, of course, uh, as geoethics is founded in geoscience, uh, geoparks are uh, um, extremely important because they are um, the expression also of uh, geological uh, dynamics of a place. So um, I see in a strong, strong connection between geoparks and geoethics. Are, uh, it's incredible. I, and I, I, I take the occasion to, to to say that the, the possibility to spread the geoethics through geopark activity, uh, it would be great. So I launched this propose, proposal here, but think about. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Silvia Pepoloni. It was a honor to, to have you. It's my pleasure. Uh, with us, uh, for sure that, uh, uh, your presentation enriched a lot uh, the, <clears throat> the amount of uh, knowledge that uh, were shared uh, during the three days long uh, intensive course. Uh, thank you so much um, for your time and for sharing uh, with you. us the knowledge. A lot of people are sh putting, uh, are con congratulating you uh, in the in the chat and this shows if. if uh, evidently, the, that they recognized the, the importance of your uh, of your uh, keynote. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much you. Uh, for that. And uh, now uh, it, it's time for the closing. Uh, but uh, the close uh, for the closing, uh, we decide to invite someone that uh, is a kind of uh, Mister Geoparks. Uh, so we invited uh, Dr. Guy Martini. Uh, uh, for those, I suspect that all of you already uh, listened, at least uh, talk about him, but uh, he, uh, he was uh, one of the founders of the, um, the Geoparks. Um, in fact, uh, his work uh, in related with the um, geoconservation and the importance to um, give value to the geo heritage starts previously. Uh, he was the person behind uh, the declaration of the rights of the earth. Um, um, was also responsible for the creation in France for the one of the first steps on this, the, the geological reserve of Haute Provence. And during a long time worked there. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the creation of the European Geoparks Network in 2000, the creation of the Global Geoparks Network in 2004, all, all was involved in all of these uh, process uh, behind a lot of uh, the creation of many, many geoparks. And uh, to avoid <laughs> to stay all the, the remaining time here talking about uh, the contributions of uh, Dr. Guy Martini uh, for the um, UNESCO Global Geopark said that today he is the, uh, the president of the UNESCO Global Geoparks Council um, and is the secretary of the Global Geoparks Network. Uh, and with this, Guy, 
thank you so much uh, for uh, accepting our invitation to be here uh, with us uh, in this uh, moment when uh, we will finish uh, with your uh, presentation and do, with your view. Let's do something uh, more, more light uh, uh, because a lot of people are from, uh, we, we still have people from China and from, uh, uh, from Thailand that they are all, almost in the day after and others from Mexico and Argentina that <laughs> are in the early morning. Uh, but um, Guy, thank you so much. And uh, to finish this event dedicated to the oceans, to the people and to the sustainable uh, development, um, your vision for the, the ocean in the coast uh, in the, and the, the implications uh, for the, the coastal and insular uh, geoparks. Uh, what are your thoughts about? <laughs> Well, <laughs> dear Arthur, uh, hello to, to everybody. Uh, what can I say? After this presentation, Arthur, what you, you have done uh, is too much. Uh, I am very happy to be with you at the end of this uh, six uh, uh, summer university. Uh, I am speaking with you from uh, from Hanoi in uh, Vietnam. It's quite late there, but uh, yes, too. I, <laughs> I have followed your your last presentation uh, at least. So you uh, know in this moment that uh, thirty percent of our geopark are directly concerned by. Uh, maritime environment by, by ocean. Uh, we have seen in the presentation before, and we know all of us, the huge importance of the ocean. Ocean drives our weather and climate, as you know. Uh, in fact, 98% of the heat from the sun rays are absorbed by the ocean. The heat is then moved around the earth via currents so the warm water at the equator is moved around the earth up to the pole. 50 of life giving oxygen comes from the ocean. Tiny plankton and uh, ocean plants absorb CO2 and release oxygen back into the atmosphere. So every time we breathe, half of the oxygen we take it has come from the ocean, so we literally need it to live and survive. When we turn on our tap in the morning to brush our teeth, the water we use, as well as the alga in your toothpaste, comes from the ocean. When we watch the television or when we use internet, some of the material used to make that happen have come from the ocean. When we buy our favorite foods in a supermarket, many of those have been shipped with the ocean. We are fully linked, tied with the ocean. And inside our global geopark network, we can present and we can share the long history of the planet oceans, as well as a main stage of this fantastic adventure of life evolution. Again, and you know that, the ocean is a foundation, is a cradle of all life, and still follow at this moment as an extraordinary and largely unexplored place. And uh, I would like to invite you now to share the videos that uh, the Global Geopark Network has produced for the International Day of Ocean. So, uh, um, Arthur, can, can you play this video and, and I will come back.
no sound. The sound. Okay, it's a small, a small problem that I will solve now. I am sure. Now, no sound. No sound. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I, thank you, Arthur. I think that we, we meet some uh, technical problems. I, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but... No, no sound? A, a problem with time, movement, and, and uh, very, very bad sound. I, 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 I don't know what, what happened. I'm sorry because here the sound was perfect. So, so okay, maybe maybe it's my connection. You know, I have not in Vietnam a very good co connection. Sorry that for if, that. If no, you don't have to be sorry. I mean, it's uh, that I would like to share. If uh, if you can give me a few minutes more. Yes, of course. Word. word. Uh, I think that you have seen in this course many practical and technical aspect. And I would like to highlight something very important with the ocean is our intimate relation that we have with the ocean, the imaginary 
that all the humanity gets with the ocean, from mermaids to the kraken, the ocean has been fascinating humans from centuries. And this relation with the ocean is very, very complex to de describe. We, we have millions of works of art, poetry, stories written about the sea, as well as religions and worships of the gods of the ocean in communities all around the, the world. And I would like to share with you to, to this conclusion, a personal story, a personal story, which is a story of Geopark, which means linking, linking everything, linking the heritage, linking the feeling to trying to invent. And I would like, uh, Arthur, if you can play the small PowerPoint that I have sent you. Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you. It's a story in the probably the, the first geopark in the world in in the south part of France, in the uh, Haute Provence, where in the years nineties we find a, a fantastic uh, uh, place with a huge quantity of uh, fossils of Cyrenian, which were the ancestors of Dugon and Lamantine, these uh, marine mammals, and uh, was built there uh, one of the first site museum in Europe to protect a uh, fossiliferous site. Next one, please. Yeah, so you can see the installation, we don't see the fossil, but they are, yeah, we have entire, the fossils here. Yeah, yeah, you are right. And, and here. Uh, we have complete skeleton of this uh, Sirenian. And at this time, in this uh, uh, Paleo, UNESCO Geopark, we create a specific museum in a small town there. And the museum was called Fossil Sirenian and Mermaids, where we have connected the history of these animals with the mythology of the mermaid. Next slide, please, Arthur. So you see this, uh, it was uh, years 80, 85. Uh, yeah. for, so for the design is a little bit uh, old fashioned. Uh, next one. And you can see a view of the museum, but uh, that's more funny for me is linking mythology with science. We connect also with artists because this uh, Paleo Geopark has developed during uh, more than 20 years, uh, a huge line of uh, artistic work. And uh, in its territory of 2000 square kilometers, we have now uh, more than 100 artistic installation in, uh, in the landscape. But we have met at this moment a very famous artist, uh, Joan von Cuberta, who is a, a national Spanish artist who get a, a passion uh, for this story. And uh, he developed a creation that I would like to invite you to discover. And uh, Arthur, now is a moment for the next slide. The next uh, video. The next video, yes. Yeah. And so I invite you to discover the world that we have done with this artist around the past of the sea and uh, this fossil. I have a small problem here. Let's try. Uh, no. No. Uh, I need to. Okay. You could take. Thank <laughs> you. 
No, uh, Arthur, maybe maybe it's not uh, it's late. Uh, it's not necessary. Maybe uh, I I can just uh, share with with few words. Okay. Oh. Did you listen the music? Guy, did you listen the, the, the video? No, 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 but it, it, it's not a problem. Maybe you can stop the, the video. And, uh, I am giving a few words because also the, the speed is not good. We have a problem. Uh, let, let's we try again uh, here. Yeah. Ah. Uh, Arthur, thank you, but maybe we can forget the video. Okay. Hello? Yes, Arthur. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I, I am sorry. I'm sorry about the techniques. No, that I wanted to, to share. It was a, a fantastic experience. Uh, and how it's interesting and important to link everything to link science with uh, art and uh, and philosophy and and play because also this work to create uh, wrong sites fake sites in a geopark 
uh, is uh, opening question about how we receive information, how we analyze information, what is the position of the public in front of academic position. <laughs> and and uh, often we receive and we take everything. So this was a, a personal example that I wanted to share, to share also smile at the end of this, uh, of this summer university. In conclusion that I want to say, ocean begins where we are. Ocean begins in the mountain, in the city, everywhere, ev everywhere drive to ocean. And uh, the point of the UNESCO Geopark is not to be a geopark with a maritime part. It, all the geopark of all the 177 geoparks that we have in the world are deeply concerned by the ocean. Conclusion, what? We are truly linked, tied to the ocean. We must take care of it because it is us. Thank you very much, Arthur. Thank I'm you sorry. so much, Guy. Uh, it was so so interesting and effectively, it, it, as you said, it's a, a nice way to to conclude uh, this uh, summer uh, university. Um, on behalf of uh, all of those that uh, were uh, involved uh, in the organization uh, of this uh, summer university, I I would like. Uh, to highlight uh, three uh, persons uh, uh, of my team, uh, Dr. Uh, Emalin Rosado Gonzalez, Dr. Elizabeth Silva, and uh, Professor Nun Vaz uh, that helped uh, on the uh, organization uh, of this uh, summer um, university. Uh, uh, I would like to express uh, our sincere thanks to uh, all of you was uh, uh, really very important, uh, your presence, your participation. Um, the, for sure, during the next week, uh, the Secretariat will send you the certificate of participation. So all of those that uh, appear and participate will uh, receive a certificate of participation. We are looking for that uh, in the end you enjoyed this you uh, in, in effect you, uh, at least uh, you create um, a special uh, criticism uh, about uh, all of these uh, and uh, um, those that are involved in new aspiring or projects uh, for new geoparks um, know from uh, that uh, all of we that already work uh, in Geopark uh, have the commitment to, uh, to share experiences with you, to cooperate uh, with you. And all of those that were invited as uh, guest speakers on these are people with large experience uh, on these and uh, already uh, <clears throat> have also experienced to cooperate uh, with the new, the, the new projects. So we have all the contacts. I would like only to, um, to, to say that um, was the edition with um, biggest success in the number of countries. I will name the, the country. So we had people in this course from Afghanistan, Angola, Antigua and Barbuda, Argentina, Benin, Bolivia, Brazil, Cameroon, Chad, Chile, China, Colombia, Republic Democratic of Congo, Ecuador, Germany, Greece, Guinea Equatorial, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Ireland, Italy, Japan, Kenya, Lebanon, Madagascar, Malaysia, Malta, Morocco, Mexico, Mozambique, Myanmar, Niger, North Macedonia, Pakistan, Paraguay, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Santo Man, Prince, Spain, Syria,
Tanzania, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, United Kingdom, United States, Uruguay, and Vietnam. Thank you so much. Like uh, as he has said uh, in this morning, uh, this course look alike a part of the United Nations. And in fact, it was what uh, we felt. So thank you so much to uh, all of you for your presence and uh, uh, be aware uh, once again about the, um, the third digital course of the GGN that will be held in uh, Lesbos Island in November. Uh, and in the next year, for sure, we have already uh, a, a provisory uh, thematic probably will be uh, dedicated to the, uh, the networking, but uh, we will uh, keep you informed about and uh, uh, you will uh, be, all of you will be very, very welcome to the, sex, uh, the seventh uh, edition uh, of the uh, International Summer uh, University of the UNESCO Share on Geoparks, Sustainable Regional Development and Healthy uh, Lifestyles. Thank you, keep you healthy uh, and see you uh, in, the in the next. So I will ask to all of you uh, to open your cameras to take the, the picture of the participants to keep for the future memory. Thank you all. And bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Thank you. So Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much from Greece. Thank you. Saludos, Gui. Saludos, Artur. Emanim. Saludos, Shirma. Gracias. Un beso. Beso. Thank you. From Egypt. Bye. Bye bye. Un grande abrazo, profesor Artur. Muito obrigado, Alexandre. <risos> muchas, you. muchas gracias. Encantadísima con el Oceano y con vosotros. Um Carlos Peixoto, aquí de Coimbra. Oh, Carlos, un abrazo grande. Thank you from, from Danton, from Myanmar. Thank you oh. so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Danut. <laughs> thank you. It was thank you, Arthur. Congratulations. It was a fantastic event. Thank you, Silvia. Thanks for, for the opportunity to be with you and you, you, all of you. It was a pleasure. Bye, Elizabeth. Hope to see you in person, all in person. Bye. Yes. Bye. Au revoir, Arthur. Au revoir, Driss. Merci beaucoup. Félicitations. Pour Il était Félicitations. très important pour nous. Félicitations, Vosrel. Tout le monde est bienvenu à Marrakech l'année prochaine. Oui, à Marrakech à l'année prochaine. Oui, c'est rare. C'est rare. Ciao, pour tous. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I will close.